Good morning. This is Joint Justice Oversight Committee, and today we're joined by other representative senators from various committees because of the subject matter is health, uh, prison health, as well as competency evaluation. And uh, we have uh, what was handed out last week or last time we met, which is the committee work for the 2023 interim. And Senate Representative Edmonds will pass those around. We also have a letter from the Commissioner of Corrections from Representative Edmonds' committee regarding uh, some of the work on the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. Sorry, I call it so. Uh, I'm Dick Sears. I chair the Senate Judiciary Committee, member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and chair of this committee, and others to introduce themselves, starting with Representative Williams. State Representative Alan Simmons. I chair the House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and I'm also vice chair of this particular committee. Senator Keisha Hinsdale. I chair Economic Development, and we will be having a housing hearing on August 15th. Um, just so folks know, it's obviously uh, usually central to recidivism issues, other struggles that people are facing that are compounded with the flooding. And I apologize in advance, but I look at my phone. My three-month-old is in the pro temps office right now. So that is hopefully going to go great. Um, and it's also a public service announcement in case it's a baby. Good morning, Senator Bob Norris, Franklin County, to include uh, Elward in the county of Grand Isle. I sit on Senate Judiciary, Senate Judiciary along with Senate Gov Office. It's good to see everybody. Good morning, Representative Therese Wood. I'm chair of the House Human Services Committee, and I serve the communities of Bolton, Beals, Gore, Huntington, and Waterbury. Good morning, I'm Ian Renner. I represent Chittenden North, which is Milton, Westford, Essex, the rural part of Essex, and Fairfax, which is in Franklin County. I am the clerk of the Agriculture Committee, as well as the clerk of institutions in the Senate. Hi, everybody. I am Martine Marak Gulick. I am a senator from Chittenden Central, Burlington, Winooski, a little bit of Colchester, and part of Essex. I am clerk of Health and Welfare and vice chair of uh, Senate Education. Uh, good morning, Senator Dave Weeks, representing Rutland County. I believe I'm here because I'm um, a vice chair of Health and Welfare. I also sit on the Education Committee. Topper McFawn, I'm the Vice Chair of the Health Care Committee. I represent Barry Town and the Proud of Williamstown. Uh, Martin Lalone, representative from South Burlington. I'm the Chair of House Judiciary Committee. Uh, Trevor Squirrel, representing Pundit Hill and Jericho. I'm on House Appropriations. And I also chair the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. Good morning, Jenny Lyons. I chair Senate Health and Welfare, and I sit on Justice Oversight Committee. Um, so it, it's really a pleasure to be here, and the conversation today, I think, is exceedingly important. There are a lot of things going on here. Um, I've been talking recently with uh, Medicaid about their work with folks who may be transitioning out of the Department of Corrections. We also have online President Golden. I think she just yeah, here she comes. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Leslie Goldman representing Wyndham Three, Rockingham, Westminster, and Brookline on the Health House Health Care Committee. Thank you. And we also have Peggy Delaney, who's called the committee assistant, but she really runs the committees. Um, and Ben Novogelsky, who is our able legislative counsel, does a terrific job for us on this committee. So with that, um, I'm going to start the first topic is health care in Vermont prisons. And we have Leslie Thornson, who's a spokesperson for the Vermont Just Justice Coalition. Can you join us at the table? Okay, uh, Meg McCarthy is going to introduce us. We're going to be getting up and down and up and down. Okay, well. Different. Um, yep. All right. Okay. Whatever. Okay, good morning. It's nice to have met everybody, although I don't remember who you all are. Uh, my name is- Well, our name tags most- Ah, oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> that helps. 
Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Meg McCarthy, and I'm from Marlborough, Vermont, in Windsor County. And I'm a member of Vermont for Criminal Justice Reform. No, I'm not. Uh, for uh, Vermont Just Justice, I used to be. Um, we're a group of volunteers working for change in Vermont's legal system, and we have ties with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. We have loved ones in Vermont prisons that range in age from 21 to 71. I myself have been living with incarceration for 12 years. Most of us have been involved with or are still involved with other justice organizations such as Alley's Line, Vermont Cure, Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, which I was once a member of many years ago. We're currently focused on health care due to the April death of David Mitchell. We wanted to shine a light not on just on his death, but on the experience of people inside our prisons, people with no agency over their health care. We felt that if Vermonters and our legislators knew what people were experiencing, they would demand change. Members of this group are in a unique position of having a direct line to the incarcerated. We gathered over a dozen stories of inadequate health care from people in and out of prisons that were eventually sent to the legislators on the, um, well, on the Joint Justice Committee. And we hope two people, um, affected people will be testifying today. One will be on, um, on, not on Zoom, but will be on the computer screen, and the other one we hope will make it in person. Um, for what we collected the stories by um, sending out an email blast to people that read our blog, and also um, reaching out to people that are on a faith, Facebook group. And we got um, 12 stories that we eventually sent out to the committee. More came in after the fact, but we started with the 12 that we sent to you all. And our takeaways were um, a comprehensive lack of mental health services, um, lack of skill and resources among health care workers in prison, barriers to preventing action to address urgent medical needs. And here I will add <laughs> one barrier that I believe happens, and that is that both staff people in the prisons and medical staff in the prisons, I believe, because I was trained to be a volunteer in the prisons, they are trained to doubt. They are trained to be skeptical when people are asking for help. And the reason is, I believe that sometimes people exaggerate their needs and they just want attention or, or whatever. But I think that that is a serious issue um, when it comes to people that are really suffering a medical problem. And I think that we've seen that several times. And sometimes we've often that. Um, changes to protocols when people come incarcerated, they'll come into the prisons with a certain set of medical needs and the medical team in the prison will tell them we're not doing that, we're doing something different. And that often causes some serious problems for that person. Deaths soon after release, in addition to those incarceration to, due to lack of care in prison, um, one of the stories we collected was from a woman's friend. The woman was in Chittenden and had been complaining about rectal issues for a long time. And they told her she just had hemorrhoids and gave her aspirin. And when she was finally released, she was told that she had terminal um, colon cancer. I may be getting the details of that story incorrect, but that's the gist of it. DOC structure, culture and structure make it difficult for people to get the care they need and have their grievances addressed. And I think I talked a little bit about that when I talked about the barriers preventing action. Um, and we listened to this committee's last meeting and know that several of you had questions. So we are going to try to address those questions this morning. Um, okay. <laughs> the first one that, that I am going to address is the question of nutrition. Um, 
Oh, okay. Did you identify yourself as record? Yeah, do I need to come up or can I speak? Well, are you testifying? Or? Uh, yeah, I will be speaking to Okay, well, I. I did, I did identify myself at the beginning. Is that who you're asking? Uh, I think you introduced yourself at the beginning, yes. I did, yes. Yeah. I'm asking if somebody else speaks, they need to identify themselves for the record. That's what I was. Okay. So my name is Jonathan Elwell. Um, I live in Browboro. And uh, yeah, I'll be speaking to this point um, about, you know, older and sicker, which is a line that you all heard uh, when uh, folks from the DOC were testifying to this committee last month. It's a line that the public has heard quite a few times throughout the spring is there's been a focus on healthcare. Um, and I think it's really, really important to talk about because it kind of illuminates some of the dynamics around these issues. So this line is used to explain away preventable deaths and make them seem inevitable because these people are so old and so sick and it really obscures the role that DOC plays and that sentencing policies play in creating this older and sicker population. So the first, like, there are two sides of it. First with the sicker side, uh, the fact is that prison makes people sicker. And this is not some sort of like radical conjecture. This is from the DOC's own data, from the print studies that have been conducted in Springfield um, at Southern State. We see that both incarcerated people and folks who work in corrections in that facility are reporting these outcomes due to their time at, you know, at Southern State working and living there. And these numbers, just to be clear, the phrasing of the question is, since starting work in corrections, I have developed the following. And then people are given boxes to check. Or since entering prison, I've developed the following. So th this is not the percentage of folks who come into prison experiencing these conditions. It's the percentage of folks who develop these um, conditions during their time in prison. Um, and so the numbers are really striking. You know, over two thirds developing anxiety or depression, over half developing PTSD, um, also physical ailments like um, obesity or high blood pressure are very common. Um, and that's, that's for incarcerated population. For the correction staff, over half developing anxiety, over 40% developing depression and PTSD. <laughs> These are really serious numbers that make it clear people don't just come into prison sicker, they get sicker in prison. And the other side is um, this aspect of the older population. So that has a lot to do with our sentencing because it's not that older people are committing more crimes or that the majority of folks coming into prison are older than they used to be. The, those numbers are actually um, pretty stable in terms of the ages of people who are becoming incarcerated. These are older folks who have been there for decades. You know, the, the crimes that they were convicted of happened, happened decades ago. For the most part, these are people who are, you know, pro-social, who want to return to their communities and who clearly also need the resources that are in their communities, not in prisons, to keep them healthy. Um, and so the other side of this is also if people truly are so old and sick, they really don't seem to present the kind of threat, you know, of someone who, who we're told needs to be, you know, kept in prison to protect the community. So yeah, I appreciate y'all listening to that point because uh, it's kind of a window to, yeah, explore these dynamics. And now we're on to the questions. Now we're on to the last questions. One. <laughs> so um, I took the question about nutrition and I did a little bit of research and I found out um, that um, the Farm and Institute New, in uh, New England with the Vermont um, Law School had done a study on prison nutrition all over New England. And they found that the prison meals cost $1.23 on average. Um, that's about less than half the cost of a school meal. I haven't been able to get the specific data from DOC. I did ask them because I wanted to know what the average cost specifically for Vermont, Vermont was, and um, maybe somebody at DFC can help with that information at some point. Um, this, the sample meals appear to be varied, um, but a closer look see shows that they are weighted heavily towards processed carbs and sugars and breads, and um, a little bit light on protein, vegetables, and fruit. 
And it also gives the impression that the portions are measured, but some portions are not measured. Sometimes they're a little heavier handed with pasta, for instance, and a little bit light on the meat or a slice of cantaloupe. Um, the vegetables are often overcooked and unappealing. People often report that they're hungry after meals. And um, according to the print survey, again, over 50% say they don't get enough to eat. Nearly 70% say the quality of food does not support a healthy lifestyle. It's impossible from the menu to tell how much this food, food is overprocessed. The uh, AMA website says the concerns of, of overprocessed foods, ultra processed foods, is an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and dementia. Um, and if we look at the commissary, we will see that the commissary is really loaded with ultra processed food. In fact, if you look at the cereals that are offered, there are three cereals and they're all almost like a child cereal. They're very sweet and sugary. Um, and there is a beverage that is served every day on the menu. And that, that is loaded with um, preservatives and sweeteners and some sweeteners that have kind of um, iffy, iffy background to them. And um, the package itself says not for daily consumption and they receive it at every dinner. Um, there's no nutritional value if you look at the ingredients in this in this beverage. Um, so suicide, it's going to be taken by. Good morning, Jennifer. I'm Jennifer Canfield and I live in Burlington. Uh, so I wanted to answer your questions that you all had uh, last time about suicide protocols in the DOC. So I'm going to give you uh, my personal experience. So my son is incarcerated. Um, and I wanted to, to just kind of get you to think about what we all have heard about the thing to do if you know someone is suicidal, right? We've been told, find someone you trust to talk, you know? And so I'm my son's trusted person. We talk every day, multiple times. Sometimes he's 21. He went in when he was 19. Um, he went through a really difficult time and he does go up and down, but he was talking on the phone and he said, mom, I feel so depressed and scared. I feel like I want to kill myself. So those are his words, hung up the phone, immediately was taken to the hole. So the hole is solitary confinement. And so right now, I fully understand the DOC's responsibility to keep people alive. Like I'm not disputing that that's a responsibility that we have to take seriously. But for him to be taken to the hole and then move to what we call a suicide cell, um, you're stripped of your clothing. So he was wearing a paper smock and it was like a Friday afternoon and it was a holiday weekend. So he did not get any attention from mental health staff. Uh, I know they do checks every 15 minutes, but that's a guard. It's not anybody that's has mental health training. Um, he wasn't allowed to call me. He wasn't allowed to have books, nothing to write with. I finally was able to get him a journal. I think on Monday I called and I just said, please can someone bring him a journal so he can write. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really embarrassing to have your clothes taken away from you. I understand that that's for safety so that you're not going to try to do anything with your clothing or your bedding. But he sat for five days um, until somebody got back to work for the holiday and could talk with him. Um, at that time, it wasn't even a psychiatrist that he spoke with. It was uh, a nurse or someone from the medical staff that was just checking in with him. And of course, at that point, he's gonna say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm not gonna do anything. And my takeaway from that was, what person is going to wanna talk about how they were really feeling if they know what the consequences are, if they say those words? <clears throat> That's our current standard in the DOC for someone who's feeling suicidal. We gotta put them over here and take their stuff away and that feels like punishment. So I think we could be doing better with that. I think there needs to be a way for people to feel like they can trust the system, that they can really talk about how they're feeling if they're at that place in their life. Um, I'm gonna to move to the next question uh, for mental health treatment. 
And you all asked, what does mental health care in prison actually entail? Um, my son came into prison after having a full year, uh, right when the pandemic started, of psychotic breaks. And we were not able to get him the care he needed because people were locked down. We couldn't get to providers. Telehealth was at best, you know, what, what can you really do with telehealth if you're a 19 year old who's having psychotic breaks for the first time? So he ended up in jail. Um, of course, there's more to the story, but my feeling is that his mental health was a big reason that he ended up there. And it was during the pandemic. Um, he did not get any kind of full diagnosis when he came in. So we just don't have the setup to do that. I know they do an intake and I know they ask a lot of questions, but it's not a full psychiatric diagnosis. And so you have a young person, 19 is a critical age for things like schizophrenia and bipolar to start. You have a young person coming in with these symptoms. Why are we not having a fully trained psychiatrist do an intake and get a diagnosis? He ended up on some meds. I think some of them are helpful, but I've spoken with psychiatrists about what he's on and they feel like that's probably not exactly what he needs and, and he doesn't have a diagnosis. So um, I think we could be doing better with that. There's no counseling. There's no group therapy. There's no kind of what we would in the community want to have for mental health treatment if <clears throat> we ourselves are experiencing some of these things. Um, he, he ends up spending a lot of time on his tablet because that feels like the safest place for him. But I don't feel like that's going to get him the treatment he needs when he gets out. So my feeling about mental health is if we really want our communities to be safer, this is a place to start because if we can do good diagnosing, we can do good treatment plans, we can carry that over to the community. So they're going to have that continuity when they get out, our communities are going to be safer. Um, so that was what I thought about suicide and mental health. And I think we're going to have Tim talk about sick months. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Timothy Burgess. I'm a member of the Vermont Just Justice Coalition. I'm also uh, the state director for Vermont Cuba. And in addition to all of that good stuff, I have been incarcerated. Um, and I am a person who works with people who are incarcerated currently. So in, time, in terms of turnaround time on six slips, I'll go from my own experience and sort of give you an update on what I'm hearing from people who are currently incarcerated. So my own experience, and this is over a five or 10 years ago, was that six slip turnaround time was approximately five to seven business days. Now, if you slip and hurt your arm, and I'm not even talking about breaking your arm, I'm talking about just hurting yourself. You start on day, on Monday, let's say, and you don't, and you say, oh, I really just need Tylenol. And that doesn't happen until Friday or the following Monday. Um, generally, those issue, the, a small issue can go away in that time. And then you're called the medical and they assume that you, well, uh, we're just making it up to get out of whatever. That was my experience. Having a heart condition, uh, having a pacemaker, which I got after my incarceration, but certainly happened during uh, the blood pressure and the heart condition developed strongly during my incarceration. The issues that I dealt with were the issues of if I got dizzy or started sweating or had heart and chest pains, there was a reaction as if you'll be on it. Go to your cell, take a nap. Um, those things may have improved since I've been there, but that's not what I'm hearing from people who are currently incarcerated. The people I'm hearing from who are currently incarcerated are saying that those turnaround times are still within three to seven days. 
which is two days, I'll give the credit there. Um, and it's a problem. It's a real problem. If you have a headache and you need a Tylenol, as I said earlier, you, by the time you see medical or by the time they prescribe the, <clears throat> this was my experience, by the time they prescribe the Tylenol, well, you don't need it anymore. And now you're on a course, by the way. They continue that track while you order Tylenol in April and in June, you're still getting Tylenol at every medical call. So that, uh, that tends to be a problem. Uh, that I experienced and that people who are currently incarcerated are experiencing. But those are my stories. And uh, if I can answer any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. I'm Leslie Thorson, and I have been a hospital-based registered nurse for 45 years. I also did a very small stint in the Windsor Work Farm, where I did 35 years ago. Uh, I did get to witness some compassionate uh, health care there. Um, I would like to talk about the health care in prison versus in the community, and I'm going to do that under the umbrella of sciatica. I'm going to use that as an example. So in the community, let's say an individual wakes up with searing nerve pain going down their leg, they can call their medical provider and they can get an appointment. Um, so you have a closed loop form of communication. You've got your appointment. You can go to your medicine cabinet and take an ibuprofen. Uh, when you are in prison, you are going to be filling out your sick slip and you're going to be waiting. You're gonna be waiting for a response. You're gonna be waiting to find out if your sick slip made it to medical. So you have an open-ended question, am I gonna get care? And you cannot go to your medicine cabinet to take an ibuprofen. So when an individual arrives in the community with their uh, healthcare provider, they're going to get a hands-on assessment. Uh, their concerns are gonna be addressed and they most likely will receive the conservative evidence-based treatment uh, for sciatica, which is going to be ibuprofen some, or another NSAID, and rest. When an individual, oh, but most importantly, you're going to get a follow-up appointment. So in six weeks or four, four to six weeks, if it has not resolved, you already have an appointment for going back to your doctor. And if you need to call for a question or you have, your condition worsens, you can make a phone call. In prison, when you're finally seen in medical, it's most likely going to be telehealth. You're not going to have a hands-on assessment. You're going to have a telehealth assessment, and you're probably going to get that first conservative evidence-based treatment of the ibuprofen, rest, and ice. You're uh, going to be instructed that if you need to come back for this issue, you know how to fill out a sick slip. So you're not gonna have your guaranteed follow-up appointment. Um, so six weeks go by, the individual goes back to their community provider, and they still have sciatica. What is going to happen then is an MRI is going to be ordered. They're going, because sciatica is not a disease, it's a symptom. So why are you still having this symptom after the conservative treatment? So you, an MRI will be ordered, and based on that result, you might be referred to a back clinic or to a specialist. If you go put your sick slip in and you get back to medical when you're incarcerated with your same sciatica pain, you are going to get that same conservative treatment. You're going to get the ibuprofen renewed. And this is exactly where the evidence-based standard of community care and prison care diverge. Um, the healthcare model in prison does not reflect a community healthcare model. I feel that um, intentionally not ordering an MRI or a follow-up study for an individual suffering with sciatica is a form of willful negligence. I also feel that pursuing a willfully negligent healthcare model for profit needs to change. And uh, when conditions are not treated, they get worse, as we have seen. Um, 
Next one, John. So this is John Campbell again. This next slide is going to be presented by Will Hunter. Well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm unmuted now. So can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. My name is Will Hunter, and I uh, would have liked to have been there this morning with you. I'm in Springfield, Vermont, where I run a housing program where I house a number of people who have been recently incarcerated. And the reason I'm not there with you this morning is that yesterday I was confronted with the release of two people, one of whom uh, I had no advance notice was going to get released, and he was released homeless as he was maxing out. He wanted to borrow some money from me to pick up his meds, and because he has a chronic alcohol problem, which is why he locked up, I told him that I would pick up the meds for him at the pharmacy. When I got to the pharmacy, I was told that there was a prior authorization that was required and that um, they had no idea who needed to do what to have that happen. Uh, I presented him with that information and he decided that uh, he would like to go to New Hampshire uh, and, and relocate there. Uh, and I loaned him some money so he could get a ride to New Hampshire. Um, the other fellow who uh, I did know was going to be getting out, I had attempted because he has a long history of mental problems and I've housed him before. I attempted to talk with the mental health providers in the prison ahead of time to find out what medication he was on and make sure that he would have it when he got out. Even though he was willing to sign a release, the medical or mental health people apparently were not willing to talk with me. And so yesterday when he got out, uh, I picked him up the provision and we went down to the pharmacy. He had a slip in his packet of materials indicating that his psychiatric medication was being called in last Friday. When we got to the pharmacy, uh, there was no record that anything had been called in for him. By this time, it was 4.30. Um, I tried to call the jail. And when you call the jail, you have an option to talk to the mental health and uh, get the numbers. You muted. Oh, he muted. No, we lost him. Gone. Must be his call. Right. Oh, this is the world of computers. I sent an email out to everybody I think of um, to uh, see whether anything could be done. Uh, I didn't get any response from anybody official, but I did uh, contact Jen Canfield, who you heard from a few minutes ago, and she gave me the name of Annie Ramnissano. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but I sent her a copy of the email that I had sent, and first thing this morning, I got an email from her saying that she had instructed that this be dealt with promptly this morning. And um, I called Rite Aid a little bit before this meeting began and found that yes, now there is a prescription there. And in a couple of hours, probably after we finish with this hour long segment, I'll be able to go pick it up. I'm using these two examples because they are absolutely typical of what I experience almost always with people when they come out of prison. Many of them are prescribed uh, Suboxone, but even don't have Medicaid, so they have no way of getting the Suboxone when they get into the community. Um, I have gone through making phone calls and sometimes being lucky enough to get a really cooperative Medicaid worker who gets the Medicaid in place, but 
I, I'm trying to provide housing and I'm trying to provide some support, but it shouldn't depend on me being able to know how to navigate the system for people who have mental, physical, financial <laughs> problems to get the medication that some professionals have determined they need. Um, the fellow, the alcoholic who's now gone to New Hampshire, um, uh, a couple of times, I got calls while he was incarcerated asking if I could transport him to Valley Vista uh, because apparently the Department of Corrections couldn't get him there. One of the times I did it, I wasted an afternoon. He never was ready. And then by the time he was ready, found out there wasn't a bed for him. The next time that he was ready and I got him in the car, we had to stop to get his medications to go there. And once again, when we got to the pharmacy, nothing had been called in and more time went on. So these, I could give you many, many more examples, but I think you get the drift. Um, if we're concerned about making sure that there is a seamless transition from incarceration to the community and that people continue to get the help they need, we need to do a lot better and I think we can. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Nice to hear from you again. Thank you, Dick. Um, I think Jonathan. Yeah. Yes, this is Jonathan Noble again. Um, and I know we have more to share, so I'll try to keep it moving quickly. Yeah. Are we to the gap or are you still in the health care versus concerns about welfare? Oh. Okay. Yeah, so just quickly, um, before we hear from some folks who have very recent experience or current experience being incarcerated, um, it's important, yeah, to note this transition. Um, there are kind of two aspects of the move to WellPath. So first, being clear that um, historically, over the last decade or more, as different for-profit companies have come in and out um, of providing health care in Vermont prisons, not a lot has changed. Most of the staff stays the same. Many of the protocols and policies stay the same or like very, very similar. Um, so it's likely that not much will change, but it's also fair to be skeptical that things could get worse because um, WellPath, as you see here, does have an extensive list of scandals and criticism. Um, you can read the quotations there. I, I won't do that so we can keep rolling. Um, but it's also important to note that like this isn't just some sort of skepticism. Like this is already happening. So I, I heard from incarcerated people last week. Um, they shared with me a memo that was shared with them from DOC, um, which acknowledged that on July 23rd at Northwest State in St. Albans, um, quote, an estimated 15 incarcerated individuals received Tylenol with codeine instead of your scheduled subutex. So these are folks who are part of the medication assisted treatment program or in recovery from opioid addiction who were relapsed because they got the wrong medication. Uh, so these are really significant issues. And this is, this is not just one or two you know, cups that got mixed up, 15 people. And it's also just an estimated 15, we're not sure. Um, so it's hugely concerning. Um, and it's also important to note that in terms of the remedies that are available to people in these positions, um, again, quoting from the memo, um, it said that uh, if they have any issues to quote, reach out to medical by completing a sick call slip with your concerns. So again, we've heard you know, from, from multiple people about the issues with the sick call system and, and how it takes lots of time to address the issues that they're ever addressed. Um, and so this is just one example uh, of, yeah, how things have, have changed and potentially not for the better with WellPath. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Tim Harrington to share about her experience. Thank you very much for having us here. And I will try to not be super bomb. I had to write mine down because if I don't, I just go and go. So. Um, I'm here today as a directly impacted former incarcerated person on the Vermont correction system. My name is Tiffany Harrington, and I was under supervision of DOC for 15 years for my first and only criminal charge. I now work with Free Heart Vermont um, for the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Um, I could talk for hours and tell you countless your stories and examples of the negative impact that corrections has had on me and my friends and family. Today, however, I want to briefly discuss the reality of prison culture 
how different it is from what the general public is led to believe, and frankly, how extremely dangerous and detrimental it is to a vulnerable group of people who are oftentimes caught up in a cycle of poverty, crime, and substance abuse because they can't see any other option to stay afloat or get ahead other than to commit crimes for survival. Our society needs alternatives to incarceration that actually address underlying problems, ultimately correcting something versus breaking our communities down. The OC estimates that it costs about $100,000 per year to keep a female in me at house. When someone has medical issues and is at high risk for a number of physical or mental health conditions, I'm sure that number skyrockets and it's quite a bit more than that. All of my pregnancies have been high risk. I've given birth to five sons, two of which while I was housed in Vermont correction, so, you know, in the, in the facility. Um, I had three eclampsia in all of them. My three-year-old son was born via C-section while I was maxing out my 15-year supervision sentence inside the prison. Um, despite being incarcerated simply for not being able to afford a residence by myself with no familial or from financial support for anyone that they deemed approved or good enough. Truly, it would have been a highly, incredibly advantageous, less of a hassle, and significantly more cost-effective to keep me in the community under an alternate supervisory program that address not only my needs, but the needs of my soon-to-be-born child. Despite being hungry, incredibly uncomfortable, and unsupported by outside means, I did my best to keep my head up and stay positive. Um, when I approached medical staff with various valid concerns, they generally ignored me or just told me to drink some water, which was their catch-all solution. Drink some water and rest. Um, countless ailments kind of went, they went largely untreated, but I always believed um, in choosing a positive mindset, so I did. I worked a job in the facility, I earned three dollars a day, I stayed active, I, I went outside and walked, trying to keep my health as good as I could. Um, and when I was released, I got um, admitted to the one home, which was awesome. But anyway, I'm just, I want to talk about what happened with my C-section. I'll skip that part. <laughs> um, I had a C-section on November, November 1st, 2019. While I was in the hospital, I did begin showing signs that physically something was really wrong. Usually my blood pressure is pretty low and steady, but it was bouncing all over the place and it was extremely high. Very, very scary. Um, with my medical history of preeclampsia, the doctors and nursing staff were becoming really concerned. However, DOC and CRCF required the CO to be at the hospital with me at all times. I remember one male officer wouldn't even leave the room while a doctor examined my, you know, lady area. Um, it was really humiliating, and the doctor even told him, please stand outside the room next to the door. She can't even walk. They just had a very painful major surgery. When it came time for my discharge from UVM Medical Center, the nurses were really scared to get me back to the facility for fear of my health and safety, because they had seen a lot of people go back and not receive the care they were supposed to get. Um, the hospital staff called CRCS medical staff and gave them very, very clear instruction to keep me on all these medications and to check my blood pressure at least three times a day, but preferably every four hours, as my blood pressure was indicative of a problem. I was really struggling being separated from my newborn, and they promised the hospital that they would allow these orders. Literally, as soon as I returned to the facility, the medical staff chose to ignore the medical instruction. Day after day, I felt worse and worse. I put in sick call slips after sick call slips, <laughs> and I said something at every medication, like MedPass. Um, I kept getting blown off. There wasn't anyone available to check in with me psychologically either, and all I thought about was ending my life. My friends on the unit could see that I would, could barely stand up and were putting in medical slips on my behalf as well. This is about two weeks after I had given birth, and I yet to have my blood pressure checked. Two weeks. <laughs> um, this is like having your blood pressure checked is a simple, non-invasive procedure, which not only takes less than a minute, but requires little to no training to perform. Finally, my friend on the unit called her friend who was working for the ACLU, who then called the prison and convinced the medical staff to come take my blood pressure right away. It was so high, I wasn't even allowed to walk back to the unit or even get off the exam table. It was that bad. Um, they, called the, they called an ambulance immediately. When the ambulance arrived, loaded me into the back and started an IV. And literally on the ride to the hospital, I lost consciousness and started having seizure activity. Apparently, um, they thought I was starting to have a stroke. Upon arrival, I was admitted, immediately admitted. Um, and my, letter, my head felt like it was going to pop right off. I had postpartum eclampsia, which is a really dangerous and often fatal condition. And I had to stay in the hospital for close to two weeks to get it under control. I had resulting damage to my brain and organs as well. I almost died because the medical staff at CRCF chose to ignore strict medical orders from the hospital. There are so many stories like this that would absolutely stun you. Um, oftentimes, it's systemic in inadequacies and flaws that create the conditions for inhumane treatment. When this kind of egregious behavior and mistreatment becomes commonplace, 
and individuals in power position engage in it, it reinforces the idea that these folks are less than. Their lives, dreams, and families are not valued, and their existence is worthless. The lack of medical, dental, psychological, psychiatric, and substance abuse disorder treatments leave these individuals in much worse states, if not dead, when they enter prison. Free Heart Vermont is advocating for alternative corrective action instead of jail and prison. Um, please feel free to you know look us up online or you know and join us at any of our events or anything like that. But um, basically, it, it, it's literally it's medical. Um, negligence, and it's something that happens very, very frequently there. So I just, you know, want to reiterate that that's, you know, a really scary thing to have to go through. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to share the screen again to uh, listen to someone who is unable to be here today because they're currently incarcerated uh, in Newport. The sounds. Yeah, they kept the sound. They kept the sound. Okay. okay, we could not get that live uh, video from an individual who was presently incarcerated with a very serious diabetic condition. And I'm going to talk. What I'm going to be talking about now is changes we hope to see, and I will talk a little bit about that. Um, mindful of the time. Um, Anyway, what we would like to see for better health care in prison is independent medical oversight by a Vermont non-Department of Corrections provider on a weekly basis. Uh, we feel like, you know, outside eyes looking at the six slips, are they being appropriately cared for um, or not? So we would like to see independent medical oversight by a non-DOC medical provider. I know when a lot of these six slips are grieved, they go through a process of people who are not medical. Um, the people that are in place employed by the state of Vermont, a medical person is not reviewing the grievances. And in fact, when the grievances get to the Defender General's office, that's an office full of lawyers. Well-intentioned, but not medically trained. Um, we would like to see uh, maintain the continuity of care provided uh, from a community provider, which we already spoke about, if someone is on a certain medication, keep them on that medication, it works for them, the community provider knows them. Um, we would really like to see evidence-based practice of care equivalent to Vermont Medicaid. If you would look at Medicaid as the minimally adequate health care in our state, why are incarcerated folks not receiving the Medicaid standard of care? Um, and for an example, Medicaid pays for an insulin pump uh, for certain high-risk diabetics who have a difficult time controlling their diabetes, oftentimes it's juvenile onset diabetes, not an older in life diabetes where if you exercise and lose weight and take an oral hypoglycemic, your blood sugars will uh, come under control. But people who have really bouncing around blood sugars it damages their bodies severely. Um, Medicaid does pay for an insulin pump. So prison health care in Vermont denies uh, the community level of care with the insulin level of pump, the insulin pump, um, 
and it's actively contributing to the debilitating complications of uncontrolled blood sugars in a detained individual who we did have on the screen. Uh, blindness, amputations, and kidney failure are to name a few. I believe this is negligence. Negligence with resulting harm is called medical malpractice. All in the name of private equity corporate for profit reason less than minimally adequate health care in our state. Um, so that is changes we'd like to see. Continuing the community level care and at least providing Medicaid level treatment, which would be the MRI in my situation with sciatica. Um, so that's the changes we hope to see. Yeah, I'm sorry we had these technical difficulties, but I'll send you a uh, link to the video so you're able to watch it afterwards. Uh, and yeah, so thank you, Leslie, for laying out uh, some really concrete ways and, and some important practices to improve healthcare in prison. Uh, and I think in terms of changes, we hope you see it, it is important also to be frank about the limits to that change. Um, and, and be clear about you know, if this system is, is truly like unable to keep people healthy, to even keep people alive, then we need to concentrate on getting people out of it. Uh, and so there are a variety of ways that this can be done. First, with detainees. Um, as of the population report this morning, 509 of the um, 1,353 people who are incarcerated in Vermont are being detained. So these are folks who are being held, you know, just, just to be really clear about that, being held um, before they've even been convicted you know, of, of the crime that, yeah, they're being held for. And so, uh, you know, keeping people in the community before they're convicted of crimes is an important one. Um, and then also thinking about sentencing reform for people who have been convicted of crimes. First, there's good time legislation. Um, that was passed for everyone, and then that was rescinded for people um, with like, more serious or violent felonies a couple of years ago. Um, and this is an important one to think about because this is also like exactly the older population that we talked about earlier. Um, and so when we think about good time for all, second look legislation, ending life without parole, the vast majority of the folks who would be helped by these are folks who are 50, 60, 70, even 80 years old and who have these health conditions that, uh, that need more care than the prison can provide. And so to ensure their safety, it's really important to let them out. Um, and then finally, um, just thinking about, yeah, some future decisions that some of y'all will be making in your committees and y'all will be voting on um, at some point about what the state will do um, for potentially replacing CRCF. And again, just being clear, not, not just about the recent past, but about decades of history where in 2003, Jim Quigley died at uh, Northwest State Correctional Facility. We were promised in the wake of that an overhaul of the grievance system, which then was reviewed by the state auditor last year. And I hope you all have seen that report. If not, I can send it to you, um, where he said that the grievance system within DOC was, was so flawed that it was difficult to even conduct a system-wide audit where they had to only focus on localized cases. And then when Kenneth Johnson died in Newport in 2019, we were promised a culture shift. We were promised practices and policies that would avert this kind of tragedy in cases where urgent medical care was needed. And we see almost exactly the same kind of situation in the case of David Mitchell and the care that he was denied. And so truly, like this is not some kind of you know, rhetorical question. This is an honest question that I'm interested in talking with you all about in the future. Like at what point, do we say that this system can no longer reform itself, that giving it more money, that giving it more resources, more power is not going to contribute to better outcomes when we've tried this again and again, the same things. So, yeah, it's really important to be frank about that. And I hope this is an ongoing conversation with you all about how we can invest, not just to ensure the health of people who are incarcerated, but the health and safety of all of us moving forward. So we have a couple of recommendations and, and also questions, which Leslie is going okay. to finish with me. Well, we're not going to ask questions of the so you can you can ask, you can state your questions, but I don't expect them to answer them. Okay. Directly at the time. That's fine. That's fine. I'm going to be he just. Will, he will provide a 
Commentary. Uh, okay, um, I'm just actually going to go uh, talk about recommendations for WellPath. And I looked around on the website and I saw that the job requirements for all of the WellPath uh, healthcare providers, RNs, LPNs, PAs, nurse practitioners, MDs, the only education they need besides their license is CPR. And I really don't feel like CPR is adequate. There is a next level up called ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support. It's not that difficult to attain. I think anyone who's working in a prison should have ACLS because the emergency services response is slow going through the sally ports and whatever else you have to do to get there. Um, so I think uh, a lot of the jobs I saw posted also were listed uh, one year experience, which is not that much experience, um, especially in an emergency. So we recommend ACLS for their, for their staff. Uh, we recommend increasing staffing in the medical department so that sick slips can be answered and timely and people can feel heard and treated. Um, we recommend following the care a person was provided in the community. We've mentioned that a number of times. Uh, I also feel that nursing has needs to have the basic skill to start an IV in an emergency. If you're waiting for the ambulance to arrive, by the time they get there, it might be too hard to get an IV. You know, you want to get an IV right when a person goes down. Um, and I also feel very strongly about what goes on in the infirmary. I don't know what kind of equipment they have in the infirmary, but if someone does not have ACLS, they don't know how to read a cardiac monitor. So if you have someone in an infirmary on a cardiac monitor and you don't know how to read that rhythm, what's the point? You know, if you can't recognize that the person has an irregular rhythm or whatever's going on with them, what is going on in that infirmary? You know, I haven't been in the infirmary. I'd love to take a tour, but, um, if individuals are being held in infirmary instead of being sent to the emergency room, then the people in that infirmary should know how to be critical care providers. Um, that's it for me. This is our last round of musical chairs. Read the questions that we have. Um, so first for WellPath. We're, we're curious what menu of services are available, what's the approach to preventive care, how much mental health treatment is available, and what range of options, what kind of therapy do they provide, and what forms, and, and what are the theories, what are the foundations behind this therapy, what are people trained in? Um, and then also, really important, especially thinking about the oversight role that you all play, how is treatment documented, um, and what barriers exist to being able to understand the treatment people are getting, um, and how can we remove those barriers as much as possible to understand more of what's going on? And then also some questions um, for the commissioner, um, which hopefully I think you might already be prepared to answer um, in your PowerPoint. Um, but yeah, we're curious where at the last meeting you mentioned um, more than 300 emergency department visits. Um, and we would love to see these records reviewed by a medical professional. Um, and that these could be a really important window to research and to understand where the care is lacking and, and where we, we can improve care so that it like, truly can save lives. Um, so understanding the diagnoses in these cases, what was the outcome? Um, and yeah, we, we hope to be able to collaborate on that soon because yeah, it is so crucial. So yeah, with that, thank you all um, for for hearing us, for inviting us to speak, um, and for having this really, really important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there may be questions in the committee of various people, but I wanted to just give a few points. I don't disagree on the need to continue to form, continue to lower prison population, but I will point out since 2008, our prison population has been reduced by over a thousand people. That in and of itself is a major accomplishment that I don't think any other state, when you look at per capita numbers, has achieved. It's done through a variety of efforts, and I, everybody at this table was involved in some way and somehow. As a member of the advisory board of the Justice Center, I had an opportunity to compare our record with other states, to 
Judge, Justice Center for the Council of State Governments runs the justice reinvestment programs around the country. Um, today, we have about 1,386 prisoners. That was actually yesterday. Of those, as you pointed out, um, there were state detainees were 465. Federal detainees were 73. We don't control the federal detainees that are in our prisons. But we can do better than 465. That I don't disagree with. Um, of the population in state, there was 1,137 males, 123 females. Only 126 people out of state. When we started, there were over 750 people out of state. I, to look at that oh, since 2008 is a major accomplishment. Vermont's number four in the nation and the lowest per capita incarceration rate. Doesn't mean we're doing great. Doesn't mean that everything is fine. And I understand that from the perspective of family members and others. But I think it's important to note that we have a lot to do, but that as you reduce your prison population, and this is missed by a lot of folks, you have a much more difficult population, more violent, more uh, mental health problems, more um, people who are have other issues who should not be in prison. They should be in the mental health system or they should be in the jail system. But the institutional last resort becomes the prison. Um, and that I think we have to keep in mind, and that is something that um, all of us need to look at. You all who are advocates, advocates and those of us who represent you. Because if inappropriate prisons have a place, quite frankly, in my view, it's just my view, for those that are so dangerous that we need protection from, or some who need protection from themselves. But on, by and large, I think that's the population we should be looking at, and the detainees. Is it necessary to detain everyone? We did a look at, uh, in Senate Judiciary, we did a very high level look at life without prison. There were 16 people in that category. Um, listening to the families of their victims, they were all murders. Um, it was something that was really difficult for my committee, some of the most emotional testimony I've ever heard. Um, so I will say that we continue to look at ways to improve. I don't know much about WellPath. I do know that years ago we had the state employees who were the health care providers. Maybe that's something that we should be looking at again. Um, I did look at WellPath before this meeting and find out they have a $1.26 billion in revenue. That's quite a bit of money. And uh, in Massachusetts, they were, the Department of Justice investigated them on the mental health issues and found that um, they may have violated the constitutional protections against cruel and unusual punish punishment for those with mental health issues. Um, I don't know what the outcome of that was. So I, I hope that we will, as a committee, will look at WellPath than what some of the alternatives may be. I know, you know we don't sign contracts in the legislature approve what the administration does or don't approve it, but um, I think we probably ought to be looking at alternatives. That's just my personal opinion, and there may be others. So with that, I will take two questions from the committee of any of the witnesses, and I thank you all for the presentation. It was, well done and clear. I'm sorry the video didn't work. But that often happens with technology. Any questions? Thank you all very much. Um, and uh, 
I don't know if that um, commissioner, are you prepared to? When you're ready, sir. Um, I think, Jonathan, um, I think you're related to people that we know. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> so, <laughs> But I don't know if you're related to the Elwells in Bennington. Uh, a ways back. A ways back. Yeah, well, a few generations. I know them well. <laughs> Anyhow, Commissioner? Can I just make one comment? Yes, please. Yeah, I'll just make a comment. I just want to thank you all for being so clear and having looked at information <clears throat> and data and brought us some of your perspective and your recommendations. Senator Sears and I have been working on health care now for <laughs> many years. hundred years. years. <laughs> Added up together, it's really a lot. Uh, in, the, in the prison system, and we, we share a lot of the concerns that you have, but we also understand that there are federal requirements and other requirements that preclude some of the things that would make a very robust health care system. Uh, so we'll continue to work and listen to you. Uh, I, I would appreciate what you've brought to us. I'm also looking forward to the commissioner's um, discussion and what um, Bellpath can and cannot provide. Yeah, sure. Uh, I just want to say that since there's so much stigma around sharing your story, uh, being incarcerated or having a loved one who's incarcerated, it was extremely brave to share what you did. It's so important that we hear directly from people with lived experience, but it's also really hard. Um, and, and with a three month old and having gone through a C-section, you know, I really, really um, feel for you and what you went through. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. Um, so I just want to appreciate what you all shared and hope that we can hear more from people with lived experience and that hopefully this was a positive exchange so that people feel like they can come forward and share with them. Commissioner. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nick Demel. I'm the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today. I think that's a good place to start, maybe, is just to pause and reflect on some of the experiences that we just heard about, the stories uh, as poignant and, and painful and, and acutely um, salient to us as they are, and, and especially for those of us who are working to reform and improve the system, um, we can't capture enough of those stories, perspectives, experiences, um, because they're really instructive to us charting our path to a better place. Uh, I agree with the Senator that it, it's extraordinarily courageous to, to come. Don't take this the wrong way, but you can be a bit intimidating come here uh, and tell a story that is really personal and intimate. And um, I think Vermont benefits from more of that in these forums. I think certainly my administration and the department that I run benefits from that. And, and we are working to seek other ways to bring that into the process. But including folks with lived experience in these forums, I think, is critical. Uh, and so I appreciate the leadership of this committee in, in making sure that there was space for that, uh, but also for the folks who, who joined us either with their personal experience with a loved one, a family member, a friend. Um, I also think it's important to start by highlighting first and foremost that the department takes this work extraordinarily seriously and personally. Uh, we have staff on a daily basis who are working to improve the system, that's big picture, uh, and improve the daily life of the individuals they're serving at a very local level within our facilities around the state. Um, and this is, as uh, at least Senate Judiciary Committee and, and House Corrections knows, the health and wellness of our population is one of our four top priorities, uh, the four areas that we really are focusing on and, and working to improve. And I'm happy to share some of that work with you today, but I wanted to underscore how important this is to us and, and that we take it very seriously. Um, I also think since I briefly mentioned staff, it's important to highlight that our staff 
live this experience on a daily basis as well. The trauma, the, uh, the desperation that can occur is vicariously transmitted to the people who are living in the units or working in the units and helping the folks that, that we're serving on a daily basis. And as uh, you know, the Defender General and I have a very nice relationship. We talk a lot about this. One of the things he recently flagged to me was almost always the first person to provide care is not a medical provider, but a correctional officer. Uh, and that uh, I don't want to step on those who testify for him, but that often that care is, is quite compassionate. Uh, it happens very quickly. Um, and so I think it's important to highlight the role that the correctional officer, those public servants play in the health process. We don't always talk about that because in Vermont, health is provided by an outside private institution. Um, but the, the role of the correctional staff is, is critical to this. And, and so I think they deserve a great deal of thanks and appreciation for the service that they're putting in on a daily basis. But I think particularly as it relates to taking care of the human beings that we're charged with. Um, so from there, we can go forward into the deck. Um, I want to provide some context and discuss the path that we're taking to help improve our healthcare system. Um, I know it was casted as, as blame, and I can appreciate that perspective, um, but I do think talking about and openly, transparently discussing the complexities of health in our system is important. Um, and so I think we turn to this often to help not cast blame, but to illuminate the real change in the healthcare landscape, the, the, the true um, the condition that our population is in right now, because it has changed dramatically since the pandemic. And uh, we met with a couple family members this morning and I shared it's it's in part because of the pandemic and in part and you know a second order third order effect of the pandemic so not necessarily because people got COVID, but because the healthcare landscape changed in that time period um, and so we need to understand this if we're going to be able to start impacting these these outcomes uh, and so that's why we continue to bring up the demographics we continue to express that our population is significantly sicker than it was five years ago. Because if we don't recognize that and, and really appreciate that change, we cannot design a health system that's going to be responsive to that. Um, and so we see that the population, as the senator pointed out, has decreased dramatically. Uh, I think a large part of that is justice reinvestment, um, particularly justice reinvestment too. It's a lot of the reform work that this committee uh, and, and your uh, home committees have done to include bail reform, to include sentencing reform work. Um, it also is in part because of the pandemic. I mean, that was a watershed moment for our system where we really did finally push out populations that probably didn't deserve to be there. They were in for low level offenses um, or, or short interrupts. Um, all of that appears to be working. I think that those reform efforts are working and we're seeing a major decrease in the total population. And so Senator Sears was right to highlight what we are left with is just over 1300 folks, close to 1400 folks. Um, and they end up being the most complex uh, individuals and cases that we have to deal with. And so they deserve a, a different response that is, is more uh, enveloping and holistic. Um, we highlight often that 90% of our prison population is on medication. Uh, there's a variety of different medications. Many people are on multiple medications at the same time. Nearly 60% of our population is on opioid use treatment medication. So more than one in two individuals are on just opioid use treatment medication. And we know that substance use issues stem far longer than just uh, opioid use. So we know folks have alcohol dependency issues and other things. Um, we have 1,000 out of the 1,300, I think it's around 1,350 folks today who have a chronic illness. Um, and we also know, you know, we have this data about the individuals. We also know, and I'll be very candid, that 
the prison environment is not the most therapeutic environment. We talk about that often. Most often we're talking about that as it relates to mental health, but that applies to physical health treatment as well. Um, and somebody highlighted in the presentation that we had over 300 ER visits last year. It's 354, which means that nearly once a day, an individual is leaving a Vermont prison to go to an emergency room. Uh, I'll share with you that I'm skipping ahead. Isaac will get mad at me for not using the slides in order, but I'll tell you today, Vermont has two incarcerated individuals in Connecticut because there are no hospital beds available in Vermont. And one of those individuals has been there since before the 4th of July. So this is not simply Vermont. Uh, this is not simply a Vermont prison problem. It's also a Vermont community problem and, and healthcare problem. When we turn to seek assistance, often that assistance isn't there. ICU beds are not available. Surgery wards are not available. Nursing home facilities, which we spent a lot of time talking about this year in house corrections, <coughs> are not available. And so we have Vermont correctional staff sitting <laughs> Uh, we brokered a deal very graciously with the state of Connecticut to help us cover the second individual. But these are the outcomes that we're dealing with for folks who need a high level of care. Uh, and it's something we are working hard to try to address, but the challenges continue to compound and in different and unique ways that Vermont had not experienced in the past. I mean, it was very rare for an incarcerated individual to leave the state of Vermont for health care prior to the pandemic. And now that's becoming a regular occurrence, whether it's Albany, Boston, Connecticut. Uh, some of the challenges uh, we've started to talk about. Um, as this committee knows, we suffer from significant staffing challenges. Uh, I'll talk a little about the progress that we've made on that front, but it means that our field staff who Typically, our probation parole officers or community corrections officers are covering hospital coverage in our hospitals when individuals leave the facilities or are on standby 24 hours a day waiting for the call to have to go to a hospital because we don't have enough security staff in our facilities to cover that historically facility related duty. Uh, we have in the last three months have had individuals in New York, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut being served by other hospitals because our own state hospital system is uh, also feeling overburdened by the volume of community members needing health care. Uh, I think painfully for me, uh, we have individuals who but for a nursing home or a, a care facility in the community, placement are instead sitting with us. If a bed were available, they would be there today and they're not one or two folks. I mean, I think we're talking close to 30 individuals. Uh, we have worked to address that problem, but as the folks particularly probably on the health committees know, uh, those systems are also overtaxed, not by us, but by the broader community system. Uh, to make that very acute for you all, what that has resulted in is folks who are living out their final days in a Vermont prison on hospice care provided by our healthcare provider with correction staff sitting there to help them through that process and then ultimately dying in a prison um, because there was no other place for them to go. Where that gets even more painful is if the individual maxes out of their sentence at that time, our hands are tied and, and we have to release them, but there's nowhere to take them. And so, as Representative Emmons knows, that often means we take them to the Springfield Emergency Department at Springfield Hospital, uh, because at least there we know there are medical professionals who can help them with the, that last phase of life. Uh, I mentioned briefly the availability of acute care beds across the state is a serious problem. Uh, routinely, those beds are not available when we call and, and need them. So that's for folks who require a hospital level of care, which is not provided in the Vermont correctional system. Uh, but when we turn to the hospitals, often it's very challenging. And, and that's not to cast any aspersion on the hospital system. They're suffering right along with the rest of the systems of care in that there's not staff available. When there are staff available, uh, they can't properly uh, facilitate the placement in a facility. Um, it, it really 
<coughs> challenge in the state of Vermont right now. Um, the staffing issue cross cuts all uh, disciplines in healthcare. I think I, I won't speak for our well path colleagues or previously our vital core colleagues, but uh, staffing those uh, positions is very challenging. Uh, I think if you asked our University of Vermont Medical Center colleagues, they would tell you the same thing. Um, so finding well-trained, qualified individuals to take those roles is a huge gap uh, across the state. And then uh, going back to the complex populations, I mean, it, there is not a day that I've been the commissioner where we've not had uh, individuals who have uh, a myriad of challenges, um, either uh, disabilities, uh, significant mental health issues, who, who fit in categories that, as Senator Sears said, would probably be better served somewhere else, but that somewhere else doesn't exist or there's no space available. Good. It, just to be understanding, the availability of <clears throat> care providers, in terms of psychiatric care, um, psychologists, even um, professional level mental health workers. Well, path provide that, or does the department have to provide that? Uh, that would be covered under the health care contract. So, well, path would provide mental health care practitioners and a slew of different qualifications. Um, given what level is, can we get some not? perhaps not this meeting, but the next one, specific information about the mental health care sure. for um, offenders, both in the community as well as in the facilities. We would like to really provide that service, provide that service in the community, but we would well, but, but we do, I know we send people to the local mental health center who live, you know, <laughs> who require mental health sure. treatment frequently go, and that can be a condition of their probation or their parole. That's true. So I'd like to better understand what we're doing in terms of mental health then, substance abuse, et cetera. That's yeah. Do you want to make sure I've said it right? Well, it seems to me this is, an, this is a very broad question, simply because there's so much change that's happening right now within mental health programs and systems. So it would be helpful to have you reach out to um, the commissioner, Commissioner Hawes perhaps, yeah. and to others, and to look at what expansions are taking place, whether it's through telemedicine, telehealth, or through um, clinical access, local, whether there are mobile facilities, and for me, I'm very interested in what uh, the contract is, is going to say, or says already, mm -hmm. uh, I would very much like to see that contract <laughs> and, and understand what, what capacity is there for, for mental health as well as for other things. But, Maybe you can you know, send a co copy yeah. of the contract to Ben. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. That'd be great. To clarify, for folks who require a psychiatric inpatient level of care, that is traditionally provided by the VPCH um, through the Department of Mental Health. But there are no beds there. But it's challenging to find beds there, yes. That's, that's right. Uh, but we'd be happy to provide that and, and also do a full map. At Riverview, we have, no, there's so many things that are happening that I don't remember really the, the changes are actually um, demonstrating a reduced pressure on the system and whether that's happening, coming. But you can't have one part of the system working independently from everything else. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, Commissioner, when you were talking about the use of out-of-state health care facilities because our hospitals uh, lack capacity, um, is it your impression that they lack capacity in general or they lack capacity for the patients that you were trying to bring to them? Uh, I think it's certainly true to say that they lack capacity in general. Um, I know that the hospitals and the uh, agency can the EH track that availability on a daily basis, and that is routinely oversubscribed. Uh, Representative Edmonds and Representative, I've centered Norris, Senator. 
I just want to clarify when you mentioned about going to the state hospital. That <clears throat> when that situation occurs, it's only to stabilize the person. That's right. And once they're stabilized, they do come back to DOC for That's further right. mental health care. So I want to make that clear. They don't stay at the state hospital. And, and that's similar, if I may, that's similar to physical health conditions that require an ICU type uh, setting when they stabilize, they're returned to our system, yes. So I just want to, because a lot of folks haven't been involved. The other thing too, we worked on this, I believe it was pre-pandemic five months ago, maybe, yeah. But there is an MOU between the Department of Corrections and the Department of Mental Health in terms of the mental health care of someone uh, when they're incarcerated. I would like to see that MOU. Okay. So I'm not dependent. <laughs> ben ought to get his email machine fired up. <laughs> Sorry, you <laughs> Or Peggy Delaney. Well, we'll make sure it gets done. Get it to. Yeah. Um, kind of north. Yes, Commissioner. In an earlier slide, you had mentioned there's approximately 1,400 incarcerated individuals within the state, but you went on to say that approximately 1,000 of those individuals suffer from chronic illnesses. My concern is that seems like an awful high number, and it seems like you're running more of a hospital setting than you are Department of Corrections here. What is the definition of, of chronic illness? Is that something that DOC sets, or is it a medical definition of chronic illness? It's a medical definition, medical standard, and we can provide that to you. I mean, I think you're right to highlight it. We look like a prison, but we are, in fact, uh, a hospital system, a nursing system. Uh, we're also a school. Uh, for a while, we were in business building things. Um, but it's to say that we're, we're a microcosm. Uh, we just happen to serve the folks that, that often have run out of other options. Uh, in the agency human services, we highlight often that folks in crisis usually end up in one of three places, uh, homeless, in an emergency department, or in a prison. And oftentimes, the population we're serving is cycling through all three. And I think that's because other systems of care are also failing and, and the folks are not breaking out of these cycles. Um, it is a high number. I think it highlights that uh, while Vermont as a, as a state is also getting older and there have been indications, particularly post pandemic, that the state is getting sicker. Um, we're seeing that very acutely in the correctional system. Um, that that's challenging um and i think we are trying to get at what are the underlying causes of that um but it, and you know we, we run a very interesting system in vermont we're a unified system so we have everybody who's in any type of detention or incarcerated setting in the state there's only five other states in the country that do that every other state has a county jail system and then a state prison system and they're bifurcated. Um, the issue there is particularly as it relates to detainees, which the Senator pointed out is well over 400 today. Uh, they can be with us for three hours. They could be with us for three years with the court backlog. Um, it's very difficult to manage that population. And then separate from that, we have folks who are sentenced and are with us for a long period of time. But if you go back to the math, a uh, thousand out of 1300 means at least some of the detainees are also suffering from chronic illnesses. What we found in, in conversations with BDH, the Department of Health, and some of our hospitals is, is the Vermont prison system is essentially a sentinel site for healthcare. Many folks first access healthcare at the prison that they did not have access to community health care. Uh, and so folks are presenting very sick. I mean, the substance use issues are only exacerbating that as, as we see folks come in, uh, go through very severe detox or withdrawals. Um, and it's difficult to, to separate out what is a substance use issue that can be treated, what is a physical health care issue that can be treated, and, and where those things overlap. So yeah, where prisons used to be places for detention, they've really become a full suite of services. And, and certainly I think we all agree that that continues to need improvement. Uh, and we need to provide those services better, but we don't often get to decide who we get in our system. So we're presented with folks that are very challenging. We're trying to meet those needs and, and really striving for that. Um, Thank you. 
Um, Commissioner, you were quick to say that someone's no longer your responsibility, I think, in relation to mental health when they're in the community. But you also said that 90% of people in the prisons are on some kind of medication. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if it was a surprise to you to hear that people might be struggling to get their first prescription refill right when they leave, if that's the responsibility of WellPath. You know, others on committees of jurisdiction may know more about the transition and how, I mean, how obviously clear of a link to recidivism and death that can be if yeah. people can't get continued care right when they leave. Um, so I'd love for you to speak to that. And um, I would be curious about nutrition improvements. I mean, I think when we've seen those in our schools, um, you know, we've seen that, I always say, you know, meals are like the 40 million we spend to get a billion dollars worth of value out of the rest of someone's life. You know, I mean, it's a small cost actually to really improve health and well being for a population. So I didn't know if you had metrics where you're trying to improve nutrition as well. Excellent questions. Um, I think the nutrition question, if I can take them in the reverse order, might be better if we came back to present to you our nutrition system. Uh, it's, it's related but distinct from the health system. Um, and I think that'd be helpful to discuss. Yeah, last time I talked about prison nutrition was neutral oh, yes. <laughs> oh. oh, that was bad. Well, fortunately, we won't. <laughs> um, so if, you, if I might yeah. kind of demur on that question, but, but promise to bring back a presentation on that, I think that could be helpful for this group. Uh, the other question I think is a really salient one. Um, it's not surprising to me, the story about prescriptions in the community. Um, and a lot, I mean, <clears throat> there is some degree of trying to connect folks out to the community. I think the biggest hitch here is nearly all, very, very many of our population are, would be Medicaid eligible in the community. Uh, but in the United States, incarcerated individuals are not eligible for Medicaid uh, under federal law. There is an effort afoot to expand Medicaid eligibility 30 days prior to release from a correctional system um, that wouldn't, those folks wouldn't go on Medicaid and, and Medicaid start paying for their health care for those 30 days. But what it would allow us to do is connect them with providers in the community. All we could help get them enrolled in Medicaid. And then when they left our facilities and went to the community, they would already have Medicaid insurance and ideally connections to primary care providers who could support their medical needs in the community. That cannot happen under the current framework. Um, and so what happens is individuals uh, get right up to their release date. And I think, you know, I don't know the specifics of some of the cases we talked about today, but but I think WellPath and previously Vital Core made an effort to try to get them prescriptions so that they could connect on the outside. But as soon as they leave the doors, that's where our legal involvement with that process ends and we're no longer their medical provider. But they then have to go out and connect with Medicaid. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever tried to fill out a government form, but they're not always the most simple uh, process to go through. And often we're talking about folks with complex needs and, and that may exacerbate their ability to successfully speak that. So we're, we're kind of pushing people out the door without the, the kind of parachute they need. Um, and I think We've talked to the federal delegation about that. I know the Vermont federal delegation supports that legislation. Um, we're hopeful. It's also something that President Biden's administration is working very hard on, is trying to expand Medicaid eligibility in an incarceral setting. I um, have an agenda problem. <laughs> we have uh, the public anemia program that was scheduled for 1130, and I'm sure a lot of people are waiting. So we could. Uh, ask you to uh, finish up with health system improvements and then maybe go to the next slides. Sure. Um, on the, at the next meeting. Sure, absolutely. The system alternatives. Because um, there's a lot of questions about health care that right. you can come back with anyway. Right. 
So I think the big takeaway here is we recognized coming out of the pandemic that the health landscape had changed dramatically. I think most acutely in the mental health side of the house, but, but also in physical health. Uh, and that required us to revisit our contra uh, contract structure and try to address these needs. And so we did that, we put the contract out for bid. Vermont received two bidders. Uh, for health services in the state. Um, we selected uh, the most competitive bidder uh, based on a, a variety of criteria, and that was WellPath. They started in our system on July 1st, and so they're, they're new, and I think we're all getting our legs under us, but we're cautiously optimistic that this will help us uh, to move this whole system forward. I think some of the important things that we wanted to highlight were really ensuring that the vendor was able to provide robust mental health services. Um, that's going to include telehealth services, and I think that's really important because there's a shortage of mental health providers in the state of Vermont. Um, we can provide significantly more care if we can expand into telehealth, not as a replacement, but to add to the amount of services that are provided. Um, and we also talked significantly with WellPath about connecting their work to our values and making sure that they can deliver the Vermont community standard of care. And, and that's our goal uh, as we move forward with the new vendor. I will say it's highlighted on the bottom of the slide. Um, that came at a cost. I mean, healthcare prices are skyrocketing. That's driven, I think, largely by staff, but not only by staffing costs. And so Vermont saw a $10 million annual increase in the cost of health services in our correctional system. I know, Senator, you asked that I not go to the next slide, but I want to preview just one thing. We have tried to estimate what it would cost for Vermont to take over its healthcare system and run it as a state system. And that cost we estimate to be between 80 and $100 million a year. We're at 33 annually right now. Would the, is that the exact same system or would it be an improved system? That would be to create a system where we could provide basically the care that's outlined in the contract right now. Um, that adds substantially to the costs. Um, I think there's also a question about whether the state could adequately recruit and, and provide the level of service uh, to the scale that we need to. I think this is one of the issues where Vermont runs into a problem that we can't create economies of scale due to our size, particularly as it relates to health systems and things like this. Um, but that is an option we've considered is how do we bring it in house and, and could we do that? And I think it's difficult to see a path forward on that. The other would be to turn to one of our healthcare systems in the state of Vermont and seek their uh, administering a health program. There's not been a lot of appetite for that, but I also think they would experience the same types of challenges that an outside vendor provides. Um, and then the third option is finding a, a separate entity to do it. Uh, but as I said, we put the contract out for bid this year and only received two bidders uh, and chose the, what we believe is the better of the two proposals. Yes, ma'am. Can you get us uh, how the estimate, how you got to the- Yeah, and we can break down those costs for you. Representative McKay, I, I know that we're running out of time, but this couple of things that were said that uh, I want to make sure taking care of them doesn't wait for the next meeting. First one, and, and if I was wrong uh, in hearing what you said, you talked about a, acute care and calling the hospital to see if they had a bed available. Mm -hmm. um, that goes along with uh, Another statement that was made by one of these people here talking about medicine keep coming, the medicine kept coming and they didn't need it. Um, are you aware of that? Well, I'm not aware of that specific case. I will say all of the decision making about treatment is done by the medical providers, not by the Department of Corrections. And that's important because they're trained medical professionals making those medical decisions. Yeah, okay. I, I understand what you're saying. Sure. 
um, my request is that you look into that to see if that is happening and, and put a stop to it. Sure. Uh, the other thing about the calling ahead, um, to me, if a person uh, is in need of uh, care right away, like they mentioned people with heart problems, you can't call the hospital and say, hey, you need to take the person there. Sure. Yeah, so I would like you to look into that to make sure that's not happening. Yeah, maybe I can clarify. Uh, in the instances where we seek out uh, an acute care or a higher level of need bed, those individuals require that level of care, but it's not emergent. Uh, if an individual needs emergent care, they're taken by ambulance. And as I mentioned, we did that 354 times last year. Yeah, okay, then, then I, the definition of acute and emergent. Yeah, that would be the distinction. Uh, so acute would be, um, oh goodness, um, if we have an individual who has uh, a chronic condition that's worsening that requires hospital level care, perhaps surgery, something of that nature. Um, but if I don't have uh, 20 minutes, that won't exacerbate that, but we do need to get them there, usually within a 24 hour time frame, versus um, you've fallen and broken your leg or um, you're having a stroke. That would require, that would be an emergent uh, need and you'd be transported by ambulance. Um, usually the acute care folks are also taken by ambulance, but but it's not as time sensitive necessarily. If it were, we would take them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, David Thompson's here from WellPath. He's on Zoom. And I wonder if we can reschedule to the next meeting, David, if that would be. Understood. I know we've run long on time. I appreciate your being here and, and listening to the testimony and uh, I'm glad you didn't fly up from Nashville. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you at our next meeting um, in September. Look forward to it as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. And thank you, Mr. Dawson. Um, the next issue is one that going on as long as I've been in the Senate, which is a long time. It's the public inebriate program. I'm going to start with Kelly Doherty, who's the uh, Deputy Commissioner of Department of Health. It's Kelly Woods. She's on Zoom. Good morning. Um, we understand there were two closures of public inebriate programs, one in Franklin County and one in the Moyle. Moyle County. Yeah. And there aren't many around the state. We wondered what the status of the public inebriate program is and that impact on DOC or Department of Corrections. Yep. Um, I'll start just for the record. My name is Kelly Doherty. I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Health. Um, thanks for having me this morning. So, yes, you are correct, Senator, that um, two uh, of our funded uh, programs. Um, for public inebriate services in Franklin County and in Lamoille County opted to close um, starting uh, July 1st of this year. So starting with FY24. Um, so those programs collectively, well, I'll separate them out. Um, in FY23, so the year ending June 30th, the um, St. Albans program screened a total of 20, 225 people um, in their PIP program. So not everyone who is screened ends up um, either in a PIP bed or at corrections or at a hospital. Sometimes they're screened, found not to be incapacitated and can be released to a responsible adult family member or friend. Um, of those 225 in St. Albans during FY23, 57 of those, or 25%, were diverted to DOC, with the remaining 110 remaining in the, um, the PIP program. Uh, in, in Lamoille, I'm sorry, is there a question? No. Okay. Um, in Lamoille County, we actually only have data from them for the first two quarters of, um, of FY23, but okay. if if I annualize those data, um, there would have been 92 um, individuals screened. 
with 12, actually 24 uh, being diverted to DOC, which is also about 25% of the population and the remaining 52 um, staying in the pit. So I know it's early, we're only in the second week of August. Um, I may refer to my colleagues at DOC to see what impact they're seeing so far from that. Um, you know, but I can say, I mean, I think it's likely that there will be an impact. Um, although I will say just statewide, we have seen a pretty dramatic decrease in the number of people uh, presenting at public inebriate programs over the last several years. And for FY23, we don't have all of the data in yet, but it looks like um, it, we're on track to have screened less than 1,000 individuals statewide. Um, compared to almost 1,200 in FY22 and 1,421. So the numbers have been decreasing across the state. Thank you. Are there questions for Kelly? Kelly, um, I appreciate it. Are you going to stay on? Because um, <clears throat> Our next witness is Al Cormier, the Chief of Operations of the Department of Corrections. Yep, I'm happy to stay on. I have a question. Oh, you have a question for Kelly? I'm Can sorry. you clarify when you say 225 people or 1,000 folks statewide, is that unique individuals or is that some folks are coming through the system constantly? Yeah, I think it, it is not unduplicated. Is uh, I will confirm that, but um, I'm almost certain that that's not unduplicated. So it would be, it could be multiple. It could be individuals presenting multiple times. It could be individuals presenting multiple times. Okay. Yes. Now, what's the impact on DOC? Do you have any sense? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Al Cormier, Chief of Operations for the Department of Corrections. Um, yeah, so we, we expect to see an increase based on, on the numbers that the Deputy Commissioner Doherty just presented. Um, we have seen a decrease statewide uh, since over the last 10 years, which is encouraging. Um, the, the concern for us, and, and we work with with VDH and uh, DSU on this topic, and we'll we'll continue to do so. Um, the challenge for us is these these people they come to our system, but they don't appear in our system. They're they're a ghost. Um, they're not charged with a crime. They don't get entered into our offender management system. Um, we have, uh, just coming off the healthcare discussion, we have very limited ability to provide uh, healthcare to this population because they're not in our system. Um, wow. So that requires a call to an ambulance should there be um, health concerns with somebody coming in. We're, we're seeing an increase in uh, inebriated folks that we don't know what the cause of that inebriation is that that causes concern for our staff. Um, Ten years ago, the majority of that was was alcohol. Now we don't know what what these these individuals are are presenting with in in the state when they arrive at our facility. So we you know we continue to treat, we continue to monitor, we take care of this. Um, right now, the the impact has not been great, but we do we do expect to see. Uh, an increase. Um, part of the challenge with with the uh, with Boyle County and, and with also coming out of Burlington is, as you recall, two years ago, we diverted the men from Chittenden facility. There used to be intakes of men and women in the facility. From uh, a, a best practice, we diverted all men out of that facility. We don't believe that, that there should be men coming into the women's facility. Um, those are all going to Northwest now. Um, so that takes up additional time for law enforcement. That takes up additional time for the transports to occur. Um, and I only see that increasing on, on the law enforcement side. The other challenge for us is around releases. When, when they are zeros or have served their 24 hours, they're released they did again. They're, they're, not, they're not in our custody any longer. That presents a challenge when they're picked up in Chittenden County or Lamoille County and they're in Franklin County. How do they get back? Um, that's presenting a problem, and, and I believe Lieutenant Weatherby will be speaking about that. But uh, we're seeing the challenges. These are challenges to, to your earlier point, Senator. We've been talking about this for a long time, um, and, and it's an issue that 
that we are concerned about. Um, so it, it's kind of a, uh, a guessing game at this point with are, are other programs going to close or others going to open? Uh, that's, that's really the question as, as to what that impact may be for us. Thank you. Al. Uh, are there questions for Al Senator, the representative? I'm going to make you a Senator. No, I don't want to be a Senator. <laughs> I'm stay where I am. Um, Al, can you share with us where are these folks housed when they're coming into a facility and they're there basically until the next morning or they've slept it off? Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's a great question. So in our facilities, we have our intake and booking area. Most of those those folks will reside in the booking area overnight. Um, they they may go into a, a single cell um, depending on, on the need and depending on the numbers. I know this is this is part of our request in our Northwest expansion because we have started seeing that increase in the numbers up there. Um, we currently have a limited number of beds at Northwest in the booking area. So on a weekend, which is when historically we see the greatest increase of incapacitated population, it, it, it's it's overcrowded and, and we see those those issues. But they, they do not go into general population. They stay in the booking area because, as I had stated earlier, they, they technically don't belong to us. Senator Norris. And Senator. Yes, this is probably a question for the deputy commissioner. Uh, but, but quickly, uh, what is the reason for the closure of these facilities? Is it a staffing issue? Is it a financial issue? If you could expand upon that, please. Yeah, it's it's both. Um, so the programs are having a very difficult time um, finding staff. So oftentimes, you know, the workforce situation, you know, in the social service arena and other places um, is definitely impacting these programs. So there's a staffing issue. Also, their funding has stayed relatively stable over the last number of years. Um, but we all know that costs go up year over year. Um, one of the challenges that, that we've heard with staffing is that, you know, these are 24 seven programs. So, you know, staff have to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, it's difficult to staff that, especially when the staff that are um, on call are being paid at an on call rate rather than actual working wages. You know, they would be working wages if they actually have an intake. Um, so um, that's a challenge, as well as the unpredictability of the utilization of those beds. <laughs> so it's difficult to, you know, there are surges and then there are times when uh, beds are empty. So it's just, you know, it's it's kind of an unpredictable system, but workforce is definitely a big part of the issue. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I, I've been trying to get a hold of uh, the Howard Center, and I have some correspondence with them. I guess what I'm interested in is uh, I'm from Franklin County. I'm interested in the actual costs that that are incurred within Franklin County. Is that something that we can get hold of as a as a committee? Yeah, sure. You mean the, their actual costs for running the program? Yes. Yep, yep. And the staffing I shortages follow. quite possibly. Say that again. And the staffing shortages quite possibly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ooh, it's under lines. No? Oh, I, I'm going to ask a question at the end, okay. going back to the contract question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's going to be my question. Al, anything further? <laughs> Uh, Commissioner, did you have anything? Um, why don't we go right to uh, Mr. Robert Bick, the Executive Director of the Howard Center. Bob, it's been a long time since mm -hmm. I've seen you. In the... It has, Senator, and um, as you accurately stated, you've been dealing with this issue, this issue for a very long time. So I'm not sure what uh, the committee was hoping to hear. Um, I can tell you that um, I appreciated uh, the deputy commissioner talking about the numbers. It's really interesting because if you go back uh, 10 or 12 years, um, our public inebriate program in Burlington, the Act One program alone would screen 22 to 2,400 people a year. Um, and uh, this past year, uh, that number is, is down 
um, to uh, just under 200 people. Um, and so there are a number of, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Bob. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, out of state and I'm using my phone to make this connection. Um, as folks have said, staffing is a huge issue in the Franklin County program. Um, we had to rely heavily on existing staff who um, uh, work in other parts of the agency to take on call shifts. We were trying to run, I think, somewhere between 13 and 15 different people um, to try to cover the shifts that would be necessary. And as the deputy commissioner pointed out, um, that's an on-call program. So you never know when there's gonna be a demand for the services. Um, the Act One program, I'm gonna mention that again, because um, that was a fully staffed 24-hour program. Um, a 24-hour day program um, where we actually had staff in the program. We actually allowed clients to walk in as well as folks that are brought by um, the police department. But um, during COVID, what we really saw was law enforcement, uh, both because of staff shortages in their department and perhaps because of a desire to minimize um, contact with individuals, substantially cut back on the number of folks they were bringing to the program. And when the shift was made to move men to Franklin County uh, for law enforcement in Chittenden County, um, it became an extra stop to come to our program to determine whether we were gonna be able to house the person or we needed to send them to Department of Corrections. It became, I think you might hear from them, more efficient to just go to the Northwest Correctional Center. I think in terms of thinking about strategy going forward, um, I think we need more screeners than the current statute permits. I think mobile crisis staffs across the agencies, across the state, could be in a position to, um, to do screening. I think there's some question about whether it might make sense to think about um, state police to be able to do screenings, outreach and crisis staff. Um, there are a, a number of outreach programs now around the state. Um, and those staff could be trained to, um, to also do the screenings. But frankly, the program has been grievously underfunded for many, many years. And, you know, part of the challenge, obviously, I, I get it. The legislature needs to um, balance multiple priorities. But this has been a program that has the opportunity to intervene with individuals um, at a moment when they are perhaps open to understanding what brought them into contact with the program and create a door into treatment and recovery. So um, uh, while the economics were not huge in the St. Albans area, um, right now because of staffing uh, in the Burlington area, which is the high volume um, public inebriate program in the state, we're at a point where we're only able to do limited screenings. We're not able to house people at all. Um, and, um, you know, that's a that's a program that has been losing somewhere between a quarter and uh, and a third of a, um, a million dollars a year um, for the last four or five years. So from an economic perspective, if we were able to get the staff, that we need, um, our organization's going to be in a need to make a hard choice about whether we can actually sustain that kind of a loss. Questions from Bob? Bob, thank you very much. Appreciate it. The next yeah, witness yeah. is um, <clears throat> Michael, uh, Dr. Hartman from uh, Oil County Mental Health Services. Thank you, uh, Senator. Um, let me just correct uh, the, uh, the version that you have there. Uh, I'm a uh, master's in social work, and I'm the executive director at Lamoille. Um, okay. uh, they attempted to elevate me, but I'll, I'll decline. Um, so, um, 
Maybe I'll make the lieutenant a captain. <laughs> Um, I think uh, I would really echo both what the uh, deputy uh, commissioner spoke to and what uh, uh, Robert Bick spoke to in terms of the, uh, the numbers going down. That is a phenomenon that started with COVID, um, and um, that is a mixture, I think, of, uh, of the public availability of drinking in bars and, and outside other kind of pieces that went away during uh, the early part of COVID. And the numbers have been going up slowly. And considering that um, we don't really see a huge decrease in the use of alcohol, I wouldn't see any reason why the numbers wouldn't return back to where they were. Truthfully, I would see some reason why they might even go up uh, from where they were. Uh, but I think we, we similarly to the Howard Center, ran into the same problem that our funding was actually cut by 50% uh, back in the uh, about 2018. Um, and uh, the, uh, we immediately went into a loss with that. And uh, we did get some of that cut back, but basically for the last four years, we've lost about $100,000 a year, very much for what Bob states where we, um, we do have to pay under our contract um, with the union. We have to pay people a on-call rate. Um, it's not an hourly rate the same as what they would make, so it's the lowest we could pay. But that by itself is just about ten thousand dollars short of the entire contract to, to cover that for the whole year. So costs for people actually working and and getting the higher pay when they're working, costs for the building, et cetera, um, cause that 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 loss. And there hasn't been an increase in the program in the ten years that I've been here overseeing it. So uh, you know, compare that to. 20 to 30 percent increases in other kinds of programming. And again, I, I don't think this is a fault of anybody uh, not interested in blame, just interested that I think, as, as Bob said, we lose a real opportunity when we can't have contact with these folks. We've at different times tried to do some outreach to people who show up frequently. We've tried to do some uh, follow-up work in the community with the police to uh, make visits afterwards for situations where these have been the folks who, who were involved in public inebriate. And they had limited success, but they had more success than what we're doing now. We have continued to be part of the response for the police about um, when they do um, pick up uh, a person for public uh, inebriation, but um, that's that's as far as we can go with it at this time. And I think that the uh, concern that I have greatly is that we went, we have a pretty strong community network here of healthcare and, and mental health and substance use providers. And we tried for the six months before July 1st to uh, see if we could find an alternative to this for the community to still have the service. And there really isn't any co other capacity in the community for it. So at this point, um, the majority of folks are now going to, uh, to custody um, because there isn't an alternative where they have any supervision, unless they're so much in medical need that they might meet the criteria for staying in the emergency room. And I think that probably covers it. Thank you. Other questions? I, I really appreciate the testimony from both you and Bob. And in terms of, I don't remember making a 50% cut in funding for that. Um, most of that. It, 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 this it year. wasn't this year, but I know. It, and it was it was um, a decision to spread the wealth, so to speak. So the half that we lost went to Northeast Kingdom to try to start a, a similar program up oh. there. But it, I don't now think. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Okay. I remember. Um, yeah. 
Senator Starr. <laughs> we can blame Senator Starr for that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, if, I can, if I yeah. could just make a yeah, comment. Sure. I mean, this is really troubling for me, particularly hearing the testimony from the Commissioner of Corrections earlier, just half an hour ago, in terms of our community systems are starting to fail. And then it puts more pressure on DOC. DOC is always the default. And nobody sees DOC because it's behind closed doors. And that's always concerned me. And this is putting more pressure on DOC where people are gonna get lost in the system that needs support services and it's not given to them. And the other piece that plays into this is the DOC budget is funded directly through our general fund. And our DOC budget at this point is about 180 million. This is going to put more pressure on DOC's budget. And it's going to put more pressure on their staff because they have no linkage to the folks who are coming in on the public inebriate situation. And there could be some real legal consequences if something happens in that 12 hour or 24 hour time that they're in a booking that that's a concern that I really have in this. Well, I'll put it. I mean, we've been dealing with this stick for 20 years. More than that, it's, I don't know. I didn't even know there was a program until I got elected. Right. Found out we were failing in 1983. Yeah, well, that, that was something else, too. Deputy yeah. Commissioner. Um, and, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Yeah, yeah, the Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. I just want to um, echo Representative Emmons. I share your concern and um, VDA and DOC. Um, we had been meeting regularly up till the COVID pandemic to really start to think through how we could best sort of limit the number of diversions that go to DOC. And, you know, we're continuing to have conversations and we're committed to working together moving forward to try to make this as um, a palatable of a situation as, as we can. So just want to reassure you that we're working in co collaboration with our DOC partners on this and that we share your concerns. Our, our next, thank you, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner. Our next witness is uh, Jason Weatherby, the Lieutenant for the St. Albans Police Department. Jason, thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, I know Senator, you probably spoke with Senator Norris about this. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to pass on the promotional opportunity as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I concur. We can concur with a lot of the things that are being said here um, today. Um, one of the, the the big issues is for us is uh, there's talk about us doing our own potential um, screenings. Uh, you know, by statute, we're not allowed to do that. Uh, it has to be done by a substance crisis team or a substance abuse counselor um, or a medical professional. Uh, in that case, we'd be looking at bringing uh, individuals to the emergency department. Um, I don't think it's a, um, a new um, fact for everyone that the medical fields in the emergency departments are already um, generally overwhelmed and understaffed themselves. Um, the, the way this whole process is kind of going down and, and or went down um, kind of left us last to know about the, the individuals holding the bag to figure out um, what to do with folks. So there was a community conversation that took place yesterday um, with hopes of figuring out what we can do <clears throat> with some of these folks um, when we do encounter them. Uh, there's multiple agencies uh, in Franklin County that utilize this system. Obviously, we're um, short-staffed ourselves, much like most other law enforcement. So uh, running a two to three person shift and sending someone uh, to another county for a, a PIP program, uh, it's not really practical um, and or safe. Um, <clears throat> So I, I guess the, the, the long and short of it is, is we're, we're trying to work obviously with our local partners here with Department of Corrections and um, the hospital staff. But August 31st is close and we just don't want that door to shut and it to be forgotten at, at the end of the day. 
Let me, can I just, so I fully understand. You confront an obviously inebriated person um, and what do you do then after August 1st? It's a great question. Um, we utilize the same things that we try to do currently. We, we try to uh, figure out if there's someone that is able to take care of them, a family member that is willing and able to take um, care of that individual. Uh, secondly, it looks like we're probably going to end up statutorily at the hospital in the ER, um, looking to have them screened by a medical professional right. to, in fact, deem that they are inca incapacitated. Um, they generally, uh, and I won't speak for them, won't have the ability potentially to house them. Uh, and in that case, we'd be delivering them to the to the correctional center. Um, Currently, in a correctional facility, they're there about twenty four hours, uh, and yep. and then they're released, um, and they may have no way to get back to wherever they came from or whatever. Right. But that's not a great system either. So. Um, well, but they're I, being introduced into the correctional facility um, right. be, for being incapacitated and, as opposed to a, a criminal charge right. in and of itself, sure. So, um, I, I, I just want to clarify, when we say public inebriates, in the old days, it was folks that um, were drunk, alcohol, um, are we just seeing that when we say public inebriates, is that just what we're talking about? Or is it also now including folks that have severe substance use disorders? Are you seeing both or is it mostly alcohol? No, we're, we're seeing both. Um, we're seeing an increase in, in all kinds of, of substance use with, with the folks coming through our door. And that's, that's one of the additional challenges for us because we don't know what they're on. We, we're not providing drug tests to see what they're on, um, which increases the, the concerns that we have with that, that population and the added burden on our staff for, for monitoring that. And there's also an added safety measure um, depending on what a certain individual may be on. They'd be more, maybe more susceptible to um, acting out or acts of violence, um, which generally isn't good for a hospital setting either. I it so, might. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just to say it might be and helpful. Senator Norris and Representative Wood. Okay. Um, I'll be very quick. It might be helpful uh, for folks to understand what protections are offered when an individual is in the public inebriate program. So uh, protections from um, arrest. That's a question. Uh, yeah, it, generally, if someone is being introduced into the public inebriate program, it's not an arrest. It's a, it's for their safety uh, or the safety of others, so that they can hopefully be introduced to resources that may be available, so they're not in the situation again, and or a safe place to um, get back to a, a <clears throat> functioning level. I would just add that <clears throat> I think also the protection is that the person is able to be closer to home and there is the possibility that we may be able <clears throat> the next day when somebody has uh, reached a, a better level of sobriety we also can engage with them with the recovery center and some other resources to try to help them get into some kind of care and uh, as we were doing this about 70 percent of the folks who stayed were willing to uh, engage in further discussion and follow up with the local preferred provider for uh, substance use care. So that was also an additional feature that has gone in because of the situation. Senator Norris, and I'm representing Yeah. <clears throat> Lieutenant Wedley, how you doing? Good, thanks, sir. Uh, <laughs> explain the process as far as if, if the public inebriation program closes and the law enforcement picks up an individual and there's no place to bring them, they must bring them to by statute to the hospital. Is that correct? Yes. At this point, that's the only location currently that we have uh, that has one of the listed 
um, means necessary to deem them incapacitated to be brought to corrections. Yes. So is it my understanding that while you're there, you can't leave them there? They're still in your custody? It, generally speaking, yes, they're going to be in our custody until we can uh, essentially get them to um, an approved uh, facility to take care of an individual in that capacity, yes. So you could be there for an undetermined amount of time, then law enforcement? It could be 30 minutes. It could be four or five hours, potentially, yes. Okay, well, I think bringing up, if, if someone needs medical attention, I think that'd be very beneficial. Obviously, if you go to the hospital, but if they don't need medical attention, I think that by bringing these individuals who are under the influence of something up into the emergency room setting kind of flies in the face of uh, S36, which we both passed last year, is the protection of the, the, the health workers within the, within the facilities here. So uh, I think this is very problematic, and, and uh, hopefully we can come up to some type of resolution here within the committee to uh, maintain this program, or at least work with those individuals who oversee this program and come out with a positive uh, finish on this program. So thanks for being here, Lieutenant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I'm trying to um, make sense out of the data that the Deputy Commissioner reported in terms of the decreasing number of people who are being screened each year and uh, the increases that DOC is seeing. So it, it, it seems though that it's relatively around 25% and 25% of a decreasing number is gonna be a smaller number. I'm just trying to figure out uh, the connection there. And then um, the, the second question would be for um, Mr. Hartman about, uh, is it just a matter of dollars and cents? So, I mean, if, if that, um, if that deficit were erased, would you be continuing your program? So. Double question. Two questions. Yeah, I thought I'd just get it in. So, you know. A deputy commissioner, if you want to go. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the number, the actual raw numbers of the individuals screened and the individuals um, being diverted to corrections are both going down. It's just that the relative percentage of um, the number of people, at least well, until the closure of these two programs, recognizing that that will have an impact, um, has remained, you know, relatively stable. So um, when you look at the raw numbers, um, they're both going down, as are the relative percentages. But um, but like I said at the start with the closure of these two programs, I think we can anticipate that there will be an impact on corrections. Okay, so I'm seeing Mr. Cormier uh, nod his head. I just had understood uh, him to say that they were already seeing an increase and I'm, I'm just trying to um, yeah. trying yeah. to determine if, if the, uh, no, I'm sorry, I guess you weren't, <laughs> you weren't live there, now you are, okay. <laughs> So yeah, thank you for that question. And just to clarify, we expect to see an increase with the closure of the PEPs. We we understand and we see the decrease as well in the number okay. of them. But with the, the, the PIP programs closing, we anticipate that there will be an increase to corrections because there's no other no okay. other alternative for them. Okay, thank you. The question for Mr. Hartman and maybe uh, Bob Bick if he's still with us is if you had the funding, would you continue the program? So. Yes. From from our perspective here, uh, the answer would be yes. We were asked by the community to start the program back in, uh, I think, about 2011, 2012, have run it pretty much with a loss every year, but the losses just mushroomed in the last few years. And um, so there was no interest in, in closing the program. There was interest in trying to close the gap financially. And there really wasn't, we tried to find some grants and some other things to do that, but we really couldn't find alternative means to keep the program open. And after four years of those losses, really had to close it. But it would take a, a you know, we already closed ours as of July 1st. So it would take a little time to hire folks and fill in uh, those positions, but most of them are still around and uh, really would be glad to come back on. So it wouldn't take long to do it, but we can't do it at a loss anymore. Thanks. 
It just, it, it seems, this is just a comment, it seems like um, counterproductive for us to now be having to send people to the most expensive place in our healthcare system, the emergency room, um, from a community-based program, which is the least expensive place um, for them to be screened and served. Mm -hmm. it, it makes zero sense. I, Oh, yeah, the committee. Uh, we can make a we can make recommendation for January. And, uh, I would ask uh, Let's Council to draw up a recommendation yes. that would be based upon the testimony that, um, yeah, that we would recommend that they do everything in their power to deal with this in budget adjustment and try to. Uh, Refund these two programs, they being the Department of Health, I guess. And how about also looking at the screening? And the screening. The but, statute. Who's that? Well, yeah. before we get too far down that's that road. Big, that, that becomes a big issue yeah, that's yeah. important. So I think if you could do that and we could vote on that before we leave this afternoon, we could send a letter to our Commissioner of Health, uh, Commissioner of Finance, and Secretary of Administration, I guess, maybe the two secretaries on behalf of this committee, we adopt whatever based upon the comment. Bob, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Yeah, the question, I guess, would be if the funding were available, would Howard keep the program? Well, uh, like um, Mike indicated, we, we have closed the program. We are um, open to having the conversation if the funding were adequate and sufficient. I think the challenge obviously is staffing. And um, I can't tell you how quickly it will take to try to staff up. I do want to highlight that we are currently um, operating the Act One program in Burlington on a shoestring right now, both in terms of staffing and limited screening only. And so if, um, and that, that program, the, the losses are uh, far more substantial. And um, so if there's gonna be a conversation about trying to resurrect or sustain the existing programs, because I do know that um, there's a couple of other providers across the state who are also struggling. I think it's a systemic conversation that really needs to take place. We're happy to be part of that conversation and, and look for a solution. I don't know who said it, but um, it definitely makes a whole lot more sense to try to serve these folks in the community where they are um, at uh, far less cost than it will cost to have them served uh, in the emergency room. Current corrections too. Um, we have one more witness, um, uh, Louis Danderand, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, the Director of Emergency Medicine at Northwestern Medical Center. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, I am the uh, Medical Director in the Emergency Department at uh, Northwestern <clears throat> Medical Center in St. Albans. And uh, the closure of PIP um, in our county is going to have a huge impact on our department. And so we've had conversations uh, uh, related to that. I want to clarify that the PIP program has not yet closed here. So the impacts are not felt yet. It's closing uh, August 31st. So it has not closed yet. Uh, I want to also uh, mention that. Uh, this decision to close PIP uh, in our county was made uh, without any input from the local stakeholders. Uh, I was not involved. Uh, none of our administration, the hospital were involved. Uh, police department was not involved. All the stakeholders that are most impacted, including uh, the local director of Howard Center here in Franklin County, uh, apparently had no say in this decision. Uh, so, it was made at a, at a level that was not, you know, uh, conducive to uh, one uh, finding uh, alternatives 
Uh, and then uh, we were presented with this problem uh, to solve in, in a matter of weeks. Um, and it's a big problem. Uh, the, uh, the cost of uh, screening these folks, uh, as it was pointed out, uh, will fall on <clears throat> the highest cost center in our county in terms of healthcare. And uh, currently, uh, the process for screening individual for incapacitation uh, is done uh, oftentimes uh, outside of the emergency department, not even including uh, you know, healthcare professionals uh, with uh, Howard Center screeners. Uh, and it's been very, very efficient. Uh, so screeners are called. Uh, the <laughs> police officer will present uh, to a screen directly outside of uh, the, the, the medical center. And uh, within minutes uh, can have uh, a decision that yes, the patient's uh, incapacitated and then make a decision of uh, whether they go to uh, uh, the uh, Howard Center bed or to uh, corrections. In most, most cases, uh, uh, the, the individuals which would uh, end up being housed at one or the other, uh, uh, the corrections was used <laughs> if, the, if the person is not cooperative and won't do uh, a blood alcohol, uh, corrections would be used then. Otherwise, if the patient's uh, willing, they would just uh, be held in a safe place at the Howard Center. And, and this program has been in place for years and it, it worked very efficiently and beautifully. And it's being pulled back so that there's a huge gap, <laughs> gap in how we're going to manage these folks. And it's going to, it's basically going to, going to come back to the highest cost center uh, for medical care in the community. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll manage it, you know, because we, we have to by statute, uh, but that's really what, what the result of this closure is going to be. Uh, we're talking about uh, 20, approximately 20 uh, people uh, a month, uh, you know, not quite one a day. Uh, the other issue is that uh, on top of the screening is that uh, those folks, one, need to be screened, you know, based on evaluation. So once they show up on our campus until it kicks in and we have to get vital signs and, and do a complete medical evaluation, uh, it takes time. So we'll take a, a police officer out of service for the amount of time that takes. Um, and then that person will need to have housing. So if they're uncooperative, potentially go into uh, Department of Corrections. Otherwise, they'll have to sober up in the emergency department, taking another probably eight to 12 hours of time uh, of our staff to manage these folks. Uh, so this is very costly. The alternative, very, very costly. So we're looking at uh, budget dollars here, uh, and we're looking at the, the highest uh, cost center possible to manage these folks uh, moving forward without uh, PIP. So I just want to mention these few things. <laughs> Uh, having the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I thank all of you very much. We'll come back to this later on in the meeting in terms of the resolution, and then um, I'm sure we'll come back to it in future meetings as well. Um, the problem doesn't go away. <clears throat> it just becomes somebody else's problem. In this case, probably DOC and the emergency rooms, which are already, I can speak from my own emergency room in Bennington because I'm frequently visiting there with my wife. And, uh, it's not easy. They are overworked and over. Um, why don't we get back together at 1.15, which if Peggy, if you could just let the witnesses for the afternoon competency evaluations know, we'll get together at 1 p.m. All right. Good, good afternoon. This is Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee meeting. Section 8 of Act 28, or S91, um, dealing with competency examinations, um, asked this committee to review. Um, where the Vermont laws to permit competency examination to defendants under 13 BSA 4814, in addition to psychiatrists and doctor level psychologists trained in forensic psychology to be conducted by other doctor level mental health providers, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, or any other specialists. And we had added to this committee are two members of the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare. 
and two members of the House Committee on Health Care, appointed by the respective chairs. And uh, on or before November 15th, the committee shall recommend any changes that deemed advisable to um, BSA 48.4 to the Senate and House Committees on Judiciary, the Senate Committee on Health and Welfare, House Committee on Health Care, and the House Committee on Human Services. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, that is done is a short slide presentation. So, I thought we'd have him kick it off um, since he was our last witness, uh, scheduled to be the last witness, but maybe each other would be good. Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator Sears. Ben Obergowski from the Office of Legislative Council. Um, I'll share my screen and go through the, the presentation that's that's before you. Um, but really, as, as Senator Sears said, um, so it's pretty short and sweet, and it's really just more of a reference point as we talk about some things for you to have. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, So, fitness to stand trial, conflict exams in Vermont and other states. So, as Senator Sears just went over the committee's charge, basically, should Vermont law expand to allow other doctoral level professionals outside of psychiatrists and doctoral level psychologists specializing in forensic psychology? That was just added um, this past session through S91, which I believe was Act 28, and has a sunset of July 1st of 2024, just the, the, uh, the psychologist's uh, edition. Um, and then the, the goal of the committee is to recommend any changes it deems advisable to the governing statute, if any. So the bottom line, who should conduct concrete examinations? And so what, what are they? They're governed by 13 BSA 4814 and the surrounding statutes. Um, and it's an evaluation of a defendant's competency to stand trial. So there are two questions that are asked in this inquiry. Is the defendant able to understand the criminal charges? And is the defendant able to meaningfully participate in the defense to those charges? As I explained earlier, psychiatrists and doctoral level psychologists trained in for forensic psychology conduct the exam. Um, what it is not, though, is an assessment of the defendant's sanity at the time of the criminal uh, offense. That's a separate inquiry, and a lot of the statutory changes that were made in S91 helped to delineate the two inquiries. Um, so going forward, competency is something that can be raised at any time through trial by the defense, the prosecution, or the court on its own. It is a threshold issue. It's not a defense to the charges like insanity can be. Um, it's really just whether or not it's a threshold issue of whether everyone can be there and really be a part of the, the case and their defense. Um, if it, I thought this one would help me understand what is probably common knowledge to the judiciary folks. Is this the sole person making the determination that they are incompetent to stand trial, or is it debatable, or does the judge decide based on their? Well, the judge ultimately makes the the, the, the order. Okay. But there's sort of a, a process that goes along. So, for instance, if the defendant is found incompetent by the psychiatrist or the forensic psychologist, um, there's a commitment hearing that's scheduled. Um, and it, to determine whether or not that person is a danger to themselves or others. So that would be a different, you know, a, essentially an escalating inquiry. Okay. Um, but that one person is the only person who can determine if they've been found incompetent first. I'd have to check, but my understanding is that they can offer, I think, a competing um, expert, if you will. But also competency is something that can be, that's fluid. So they may be found incompetent, but if they regain competency and have another exam um, proving that, uh, they can go on with, with the charges against them. And, um, and that's what this last point kind of touches on, is that someone who's found incompetent, who later comes back into competency, can then be recharged with the crime. So that's, again, different than insanity, where if you're deemed insane, it's a complete defense of the charges. Does it have, is, is it this, because clearly I'm just 
asking all these questions because this person becomes really important. Like their skill set becomes really important. So do they, are they the same ones who have to find the person competent again, or you could get a different expert So the, say, you know what, actually they're competent. So it would be, you know, again, the defendant, the prosecution of the court who would, you know, order or move the court for an examination. Um, and it's whoever the court appoints okay. um, in that instance. And let me review the statute um, after this, just because I, I know that there is a, a process that addresses your issue. I just can't recall it off the top of my head at the moment. Um, I do see that there is a hand raised on the screen. Is there a hand raised? Um, I don't we see it. See it. Yeah. 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 It's from... Um, uh, yeah, Karen Barber, uh, for the record, General Counsel of DMH, I can answer your questions if that's helpful. Sure. Um, yeah, so they are not the only person that decides. So they are, so um, competency evals that are um, uh, done by the Department of Mental Health are neutral evaluators, right? And so they do um, make a determination as to what they think. But at any time, the defense or the state can hire their own um, and they can contest competency. So just because our evaluator says competent doesn't mean the defense can't hire one that says incompetent. And then the, there's a hearing and then the court makes a decision it works the other way as well. So if we find incompetent, the state can hire their own that says competent. And then there will be a contested hearing and the court would make a determination. OK. And it is not always the same evaluator. Um, so sometimes it could be. Um, so if, if the department is ordered to do a second evaluation, sometimes it would be the same evaluator, but sometimes it wouldn't. It just kind of depends who is available. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, continuing on, and, and the, the point that Ms. Barber just made is really, uh, from my understanding, the, the threshold issue of why this is there. It's availability of the, um, of the, the provider, essentially. And um, my understanding of sort of the policy dilemma that came out of the session was, on the one hand, making more people available because there is a backlog of uh, competency, competency examinations and those who are available to do it. Um, and that's weighed against expanding that to people that may not uh, be as accurate in their in their competency. So that's sort of the pol the policy considerations facing um, all of you. Can I ask a, a clarify? Just based on what um, was just mentioned, it's the Department of Mental Health currently that would do these <clears throat> competency evaluations with the psychiatrists that are currently licensed to do this, but they're through the Department of Mental Health. Is that correct? That's my understanding. That's what was I just understood. Well, well, we have a number of witnesses. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I would defer to the... But if we expand it, they would still have to be under the with the Department of Mental Health. But um, I do think... They arranged them. Yeah, unless they're arranged independently by the defendant. Um, I do think that it's otherwise up through the prosecution, oh, through the department. Um, and just for... Ben, can you talk a little bit about what it means to be competent? I mean, some is frequently confused with insanity, and so competent, what competency means in terms of understanding the judicial <coughs> process and so on. Mm -hmm. we talk about that. Um, well, it, it goes back to really those two fundamental questions from the previous slide, um, which is being under being able to adequately participate in your defense. So interacting with your attorney, um, being able to give approval to certain uh, legal strategies, if you will. Um, but then there's the, the initial threshold question is being able to understand the charges against you. Um, and so this goes into, I mean, just a, a basic level competency of really just, I mean, understanding not just what the consequences are of being charged with these crimes and potentially being convicted of them, but also um, what, what goes into that, what the court process is, what's entailed in that. And so, and that's different than an insanity defense, which again, is something that is really um, 
the end all be all. It's a complete defense and not something that's assessed. It's an insanity defense that's assessed at the time of the crime that was committed. Competency is at the time of trial. So you may be, again, incompetent at one point in time, but then later regain competency to undergo the process. It doesn't matter if you're competent at the time of the crime. Correct. It's all about at the, at the time of trial. At the time of trial. But insanity is at the time of the offense. And, and again, part of the statutory changes were uh, was to help kind of make the distinction between those two different inquiries. Um, they used to be combined. Right. Um, and so just as a comparison for some other states and who's permitted to do uh, these, these exams in New York, um, it's performed by a psychiatric examiner, which can be a qualified psychiatrist who has uh, a degree you know, certified by the Board of Neurology and Psychiatry or eligible to be certified by the board, or a certified psychiatrist, psychologist who's registered um, as such under New York law. Um, so they also permit other psychologists. It's not as narrow as the sunset that was done in S91 where it's someone trained in forensic psychology, but um, it does permit for certified psychologists. Um, in Rhode Island, my understanding is that Rhode Island is the only other state that, like Vermont, until this most recent session, only allowed psychiatrists to perform the exam. Um, and so again, conducted by um, a psychiatrist or physician li li licensed under Rhode Island law. And then Oregon um, has a little bit of a different process, but as far as who can perform <clears throat> the exam, it's done by, again, a certified examiner who completes forensic evaluator, uh, forensic evaluator training program, and that um, can be a psychiatrist, so one licensed by the medical board in that state and completed a residency program in psychiatry, and then also a psychologist licensed by the board of psychologists in Oregon. So just for some comparison purposes. Any other questions? I just want to be really clear. This is, oh, you only apply competency exams in criminal cases, not family court, not yes. juvenile court. Correct. In, in this context, okay. yes. Well, there's a great area. Yeah. <laughs> a little different. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit different, and juveniles are always treated a little bit differently <laughs> yeah. than, than adults. So it, it is different, but this is just about competency in Title 13 um, and who can um, conduct the examinations, not necessarily who is subject to. So this is all adult. Are there any other questions? Um, I'm, I'm just um, uh, curious, having not had testimony on this in my committee about. Um, are there were there suggestions in testimony about who the other professionals might be? That I, I don't know because I was not a part of those procedures. It was a Senate bill, so I'll ask. So something other, somebody other than a doctoral level psychologist is that what they're? No, a doctor. Doctoral level, right? Yes. So aren't they already able to do that? No, they weren't until this year and they now and the sunset for next year. So oh okay the uh, sunset. We'd have to make a recommendation. But the problem part of the problem is the lack of psychiatrists to do the evaluations. And the second problem that we heard about was the number of people who don't make appointments. There are scheduled appointments that take what four or five hours do the competency evaluation and the people don't show up. So yeah. You heard more than we did on that. Yes, we did. And so so we did hear a lot of testimony and the result was we'd like to have this joint committee look at the issue and provide a recommendation. But I think correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's one uh, forensic psychiatrist who does uh, evaluations in the state right now, so expanding it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not against yeah, no, expanding no, no, it. I, I thought we already had, uh, but it just passed this year. I mean, I, workforce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Supply and demand. Yeah, um, doctor level psychologists honestly might. 
have a broader understanding of competency. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what I'm not seeing here is that we have a board that certifies who's qualified to do this examination like exists in some of these other states. It's through their professional yes. certification. Their okay. Process. So a lot of sense. Yeah. I didn't know. It looks like psychologists through the through OPR. So psychiatrists through that's what we're talking about in these other states is the same licensure. So. Then it's not an extra layer of like, yes, you yeah, can. Yeah, exactly. So okay. as psychiatrists, it's um, you know, can practice through the, the medical board here, or it's been given a license, a psychologist that's been given a license through OPR. Okay, so these uh, the other states didn't add a <laughs> approval. Um, no, I mean, Oregon, of the ones that I studied, has that required sort of forensic training course, but that's something that's separate and apart from the licensing of their individuals. So, um, that's just a policy choice that that state made. Um, and as far as who we're talking about, Representative Wood, uh, in the charge, uh, one that's explicitly mentioned is psychiatric nurse practitioners as another doctoral level um, uh, practitioner that could be considered. But it, it's open-ended to, to read any other <clears throat> medical professional that has a doctoral level certification. Yes. Did it? Along your lines, does the person have to go through OPR, their, their regulations? Psychologist. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's for your licensure. Yes. So the licensure. If you're going to get a correct, you, there are a lot of certificates that you could get after any licensure and after any degree. So that ben, ben will clarify, but so they can go through the certification process for forensic analysis. So it's it's just it's an educational certificate. And do they have to do it within a specific period of time like OPR says you have to in five to supervise the work and so on within five years. If you don't do it, you don't get it. I, I don't think that's part of it. It's 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 an external certification. It's not an OPR certification. OPR. So this is over and above that. Yeah, it is. Exactly. Get, you get your license through OPR and you have your license through uh, the Medical Practice Board. Yeah. And then you can go ahead and study other things that allow for you to practice in your profession. So as a forensic psycho psychologist or a psychiatrist. Yeah, that would be spot on. Uh, the, the, the license itself is done by either the medical board or OPR, but the certification in forensic psychology, that's something that would be. Um, I, there are trade groups. Um, I'd imagine that there's the American you know, Association of Psychologists, things like that. Okay. We could ask the next witness. Yeah. Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. That question. No, thank you, Ben. <laughs> Oh, um, I did see that Representative, um, I don't know what's your name, I'm sorry, Burbeco? Rebecca. Rebecca. Oh, oh Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering maybe if, if Karen could speak to the um, competency evaluation itself and whether that is something that's is it administered with a tool or is there some sort of objectivity to it? Um, as we think about what level of clinician or training is required, I'm curious just how standardized the process is. And then we have a question from our Senator Gold. <clears throat> oh, so you'd you like my question now. now? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so it depends, right? Um, there is no like set test. Um, there, there are certain things they are looking at, um, but I think one of the things to remember is you can be incompetent for lots of reasons, right? It could be a mental illness. It could be a developmental disability. It could be a TBI. It could be substance use. Um, so it really depends on what the person um, 
presents with. One of the reasons why getting records um, in advance is so important is because the psychiatrist has a sense of any past history and so may have a sense of where their where their questions need to be. You know, currently, if someone has an intellectual disability, we refer that to a, psych a psychologist um, because they can do some more specialized testing. Um, but there's no kind of set. Every every evaluation looks the same. It really depends on the person's clinical presentation. Did you have, okay, Reverend go Did you have a question for Ben or for uh, somebody else? It's a general question. Um, OPR pays attention to scope of practice so that when a clinician does apply for a license, the medical board as well, you have to state your scope of practice. And I was wondering if forensic examinations might be part of the scope of practice in this context. So that's a question that I'm curious about. Okay. okay. Yeah. So why don't we go with um, Karen Barber? Is Emily Haas here or just Car Karen from DMH? Just me. Just you. Okay, fine. Um, Karen, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. For the record, Karen Barber, General Counsel of the Department of Mental Health. We did submit some written testimony. I don't know if um, you had a chance to- I'm sure um, we do. Review yeah. that. Um, so the department doesn't um, take a position on whether or not um, you should expand. Um, what I can do maybe is answer your questions. That may be more helpful and kind of talk you through where we're at. One of the things I will say, um, because there's been a lot of questions about their qualifications, so DMH sets qualifications for people we contract with. Um, and so I was just pulling up um, our last RFP. So we require that someone hold a current uh, license in the state of Vermont. Um, we require that our psychiatrists are board certified. By. And then we also require um, some level of additional forensic training um, which could be um, a forensic psychiatry review course offered by the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law. I can't tell if I have feedback or someone's asking a question. Just feedback. Just feedback. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, or that they write a sample competency and sanity eval that we review. So we, um, we do set um, kind of quality parameters. I'm the same with the psychologist we use that does the disability evaluations. Um, I don't have his RFP up in front of me, but again, we do require some level of specialized training just to make sure that um, that people uh, that the people we're hiring that are licensed in the state of Vermont and do have the specialized training and are able to do these evaluations. The other thing I I can say that was talked about in our um, and our memo is that um, we do currently have 16 evaluators, um, 15 psychiatrists, and then we have the one psychologist that we have, um, that we had had before the statutory change. We have not enlisted any more evaluators. Um, as I had kind of mentioned in the past, for us, it wasn't so much the number of evaluators, it was the process that was taking a really long time and was administratively burdensome. We did just this week roll out a new process that we hope to really streamline um, our ability to do evaluations. And we're hoping we can do up to a week going forward under the new process. Uh, we do, um, when we submitted this memo yesterday, it was numbers from Friday and we had 88 on the wait list. Right now we have 75, I just checked. So we are working, we've, um, we've scheduled 17 in the last uh, week. So we are working. Um, to to move through the waitlist as soon as possible. Again, the problem is not necessarily that we don't have enough evaluators. It's actually trying to get them scheduled at this point. Um, there are a lot of really great changes that um, were made in S91. We don't fully know the impact of those yet, but we are working on tracking that data much more closely. We do still have about 25 sanity evaluations that we need to get through. Um, so we are, haven't yet seen the benefits of that, um, but we have, um, based on the new changes, Inovatel was able to retain many more psychiatrists than they were before. Um, just to give you an example, pre-COVID, we had five evaluators. Uh, we now have, as I said, 16. So uh, we are rolling out the new process. Um, 
it is going to um, hopefully be less administratively burdensome on the department and allow us to more quickly schedule these evaluations. I think one of the things to remember, right, is this is just a very small part of what the department does. Um, and this is scheduling these evaluations is a huge administrative undertaking um, for one of the paralegals in the legal department who has many other job responsibilities. So she is working as quickly as possible as she can. We're working on getting her some support and again, streamlining that process. Um, but right now we don't necessarily need more evaluators. What we need is to kind of figure out a process um, so that we can be referring them more quickly. One of the things we've asked of the court is to make sure we're getting all the documentation right off the bat. So that's not a delay. One of the things we've asked uh, defense counsel is to get back to us more quickly about whether or not a date will work. In the past, we were just kind of waiting until we heard back. Uh, we've now set kind of a 48 hour deadline. And if they don't accept within that time, then we're gonna move on and assign that time to the next person. So we're really thinking about how we can work through these things. I hope to be able to come back in a couple months and have more of an update, but it's too early right now to see what actually, um, how the new process is going to roll up, but we do anticipate it having a significant impact on the wait list. Uh, there's a different testimony than we heard this winter. Um, Not from me, but yes, I know the Defender General did feel strongly that psychologists made sense, and I, and I and we respect that, right? Um, from, from our case, we've always felt that it was other issues causing some of the delays, and you very we do think a lot of the changes in S91 are the changes we asked for, such as the orders. Um, separating competency and sanity, making sure we could get the records, issuing the bench warrants if someone's don't show. Those are all the things that we really felt like were going to have an impact. And we do anticipate that they are going to have an impact. We're just starting to kind of slowly see that. Thank you. Um, so I'm always curious about places where bias or some discrepancy can, can creep into the process. So my question, and maybe you can help me if I'm not understanding this clearly, if they come through your office, is that because there was, it's a, it's a public um, payment for this, this expertise, as opposed to if they get their, they hire their own private person to make the evaluation, is that sometimes because the, the legal team can afford um, to hire a different expert? And do you monitor any trends in the people that you hire if some tend to find more competency or incompetency? Do you sort of track demographics of what they <laughs> find and if there's any age, gender, or race um, discrepancy in who's deemed competent or incompetent? I'm just trying to better understand what, where, where someone could use a new category <laughs> of evaluator to, if they have money or resources, be able to hire somebody as opposed to what your office does, which is it is a public process. Are you hired by the court, therefore you're paid by the court and there's not money exchanging hands from the person who's hiring an attorney? So, um, so the court doesn't pay or hire anyone. It's all DMH, right? They'll make a referral to the Department of Mental Health and we arrange for it. Um, so there's a couple different ways, right? You can get an evaluation. The court can order DMH to provide a neutral evaluation. Um, yes, or either party can go out and get their own and they're free to hire who they want. I think what you heard was a lot of testimony from the Defender General that they tend to hire psychologists. It's just like in any other case, right? You're allowed to get your own expert. Um, if you're represented by the Defender General, then the Defender General pays for it. Um, the state, um, you know, the state's attorneys have a budget. So certainly, I, I guess, yes, if you're also, um, if you have private counsel, then you're kind of privately hiring them. But other than that, um, it would be the Defender General's office or uh, the state's attorney's office who are doing it. We don't um, dive real deep into the data as to who's found incompetent and who's not. Again, you know, these are not necessarily folks in DMH custody. They may not even have a mental illness. Um, this is a very small part of what we do. We do look kind of trend wise. Um, I think about maybe 50% of those ordered are found incompetent. I'd have to double check. 
Um, but we kind of look at it that way. Um, we are trying to think about what data may be more helpful um, to collect. But again, we don't, we're not a part of these cases. Um, so we don't necessarily know what happens, right? Once they're found confident, we are done with it. If they are found incompetent, they may ask. Um, to see if they qualify for DMH services, but they may not, right? Because again, you can be incompetent for many reasons. So we don't necessarily know the outcome of these cases and we're not a party. Um, hi, I'm not a standing member of this committee and a bit of an interloper today, but I do have a question um, around scheduling. It seems really important. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to what the administrative burdens are around scheduling other than it sounds like the friction of time and distance are problematic but um, i'd love to hear a little bit more about that sure um so what was happening um was that we we'd get a request um sometimes the court would send the relevant information we needed in terms of like the the charging documents and the affidavit sometimes they wouldn't um, and then we work to go to our contractors and say, we have these evaluations, they give us dates and times that work for them. And then what we were doing is then going to the defense counsel and saying, hey, would this date and time work for you? And then they contact their client and it could be a couple of days, it could be a couple of weeks until we hear something. Um, and then we would try to schedule it. Um, assuming those dates still worked for everyone. Um, and then if we didn't have the records, um, the evaluator maybe couldn't finish the evaluation because they needed the records. We get a lot of no-shows. If the person doesn't show, then that's all this time wasted. No one else can be fit into that spot. And uh, the wait list is moving. So um, the new process is that we're not going to go back and forth about dates and times. It's too administratively burdensome. It means we can only refer you know, a limited number a week versus just sending out a mass. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a date and time from the evaluator. We're going to give that date and time to the defense counsel. If that works, great. If it doesn't, then we'll schedule it in the following week and hope that works. Um, but we need to much more quickly move through because we have, you know, one paralegal who has got many more things than just this she needs to do that was spending all of her time on emails trying to coordinate people's schedules. Um, and it just wasn't working. It was really causing um, those delays. The other thing is, you know, we're counting on the defense counsel to try to contact their client. A lot of times they can't find their client. So we're not, we don't know if they're going to show or not. Um, and then if they don't show, there was no consequence for them not showing, right? It just would mean our evaluators didn't want to take those cases because they were losing that money. And it meant that that time was wasted um, because evaluators set aside huge chunks of, of a time of a day to do these um, that no one else could use at that point because it was too late. So we're also going to ask a week in advance that people confirm that they can still do that date and time. And if they don't, we're going to assign it to someone else. So ideally, we're not losing so much. Um, so again, we're asking people to be a little bit more involved and help us out a little more so that hopefully we can more streamline the process. Okay. Thank you. So, um, yes, done. Karen, uh, the, the problem was being solved through the Legislation Act 28 was to place the competency hearing prior to the, any uh, assessment of insanity. So that's one problem that's being solved to carry, to go forward. And I think the courts are very thankful <clears throat> that's happened. And then uh, if someone is declared incompetent to stay on trial as a result of the evaluation, what happens? It depends, uh, which is a very loyal lawyer answer. Um, but it, it depends one on we why. Love, we love those black and white answers, <laughs> clear answers. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so the biggest thing is it depends why they were found incompetent. Um, so was it a mental illness? And so do they? If so, then they may have. They'll reach out to the Department of Mental Health, and we'll think about: is an order of non-hospitalization appropriate? Is an order of hospitalization appropriate? If they had an intellectual disability, is an Act 248 order appropriate? Um, it was if it's substance use or dementia. We don't really have involuntary programs for those. Um, so it really depends on the needs of the person. Um, one of the things we were also asked to look at 
um, in S91 was the potential for competency restoration and that, that could, you know, potentially change how things go right now, how things go in the future. But right now, um, Vermont does not have any sort of restoration uh, mandate. And so no one is actively restored to competency that doesn't exist. They may get there as a benefit of, of treatment or just engaging, um, but there's no, um, we're not trying to restore them to competency, even if they were to come into say the DMH system or the Dale system. And then one further clarification, which we probably hear from um, Dale, that an individual with an intellectual or developmental disability would be evaluated by someone who understands uh, those areas. Yes, so that, that would still be DMH, right? So DMH is still the one that hires the forensic psychologist. So Dale doesn't have anything to do with competency evaluations. They may end up receiving custody through Act 248 at the end of the process, but they are not involved in the initial process at all. It's solely DMH that holds those contracts. Um, but yes, if there is a, a suspicion of an intellectual disability, then we use our forensically trained psychologist to do the evaluation. Um, if we know right away that may be an issue, then Dr. Donnelly is assigned right away. Um, if we're unclear, then we would, um, we would first assign a psychiatrist. And if the psychiatrist says, hey, actually, I think that what I'm seeing might be an intellectual disability, then we would ask Dr. Donnelly to do the evaluation. Um, so they are getting specialized evaluations, but again, that's all through DMH. Thank you for clarifying. Um, what I'm a little confused by the Dale role. They don't come into it until after the psychiatrist or psychologist would find that the person has an intellectual disability. Correct. So they're not even, that's how somebody gets to Act 248. Right, right. That, that's there any, after there's been a competency determination. Is there any uh, victim involvement? In the competency evaluation process or no, in the no, actual? I meant in the process. They know, do they have any? Um, I do not, apologies, I do not know much about the Act 248 process, so I am not sure. Um, so I, I can say on the DMH side, no, like if someone was getting an order of non-hospitalization, there wouldn't necessarily be any victim involvement, right? Because it's a clinical determination about whether or not right. someone needs their services. I don't know how that works on the Dale side. It could very well be different. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, this might be a question for those who heard this testimony, but first, Karen, in addition to being legal counsel, are, are you a licensed mental health professional in any capacity? Me, personally? Yes. No. Okay, I, I didn't ask that as a tack on you, but I'm looking around and who we're not hearing from are mental health professionals about the, what this changes. This is our first hearing okay. on this that's gonna take four meetings okay. to get through. And so, so I guess then, that's why I right thought- Right now we're having that yeah. mental health yeah and then explaining what our charge is. And okay. I expect at our next meeting, we'll hear hopefully from mental health professionals right. as well as victims. Right. I mean, my only comment in this context is hearing from DMH that they feel like the problem was not a personnel related problem. It's a court issue. The, court, the courts were finding a confusion about having uh, and the, I, I can't speak for the court, mm -hmm. but certainly the confusion around having uh, competency hearing and insanity uh, hearings going on concurrently and trying to put it into a stepwise progression. Yeah. So you're either competent or incompetent to stand trial. And then if you do stand trial, did you have sanity at the time of the, that you committed the crime? Right. So the so what we're doing now is understanding that there was a backlog, what whatever the cause of the backlog for the competency hearing. And we're hearing from Karen that 
some of this is being resolved for whatever reason. That's good to hear. Uh, but for until next year, we have uh, forensic psychologists as well as psychiatrists performing the competency hearing. So there's there's a lot going on, and things are kind of being pulled apart and solved at the same time that we're still trying to solve the problem. Right. So I would just in the future meetings want to make sure that we're not letting a, a quality question be answered by a logistical question, that changing the timing is different than having different types of professional who, who, who can make this determination. Right, but when you have a backlog, then you also want to consider numbers of professionals who are available to do that analysis. So it's a catch-22. You do one or you do both, and so now we're actually doing both. So see how it goes. And, and Ben, remind me, it's a preponderance of the evidence that can, must be demonstrated uh, for to demonstrate incompetency or competency. Um, I believe so. I, I need to, which okay. side of the issue? Let me check for you. Did, okay. did, did your committee hear, your committee was the jurisdictional committee? <clears throat> Came from judiciary. Okay. To, to our committee, so yeah. we work collaboratively. Did you hear opposition to this change? Not opposition to psychologists. Okay, so psychiatrists didn't come in and say they don't have X, Y, or Z No, I think, I think at the time we recognized, uh, you know, going back to the testimony this morning about psychological, you know, psycho mental health care in the institutions, it's, there's a shortage of professionals. And, that's part. Thank you. I was just wanted to add that there was going to be an all day conference coming up about mental health in the courts, and that might be something that would be really useful. And you're all excited. Yeah. yeah. Might be. I forget what the yeah, date. We have Judge Zone coming up so shortly, but first, if there are any other questions for Karen, but we will hear from okay. the medical society at the very least, as well as they the, who represents psychologists. Psychologists. What group? I'll find out. It's not the medical society. No. It's got to be a um, And psychiatric social workers. Yes. I'm not sure. Um, our next witness is Defender General Matt Valerio. Thank you, Aaron. Matt, good afternoon. Hi, let me just get this on. You are on. September 14th. I'm, uh, I'm all, uh, yes, and, and thank you for having me. I am Matt Valerio. I'm the Defender General. This uh, suggestion of having uh, psychologists do forensic competency evaluations was my suggestion. Um, this arose out of initially a shortage of individuals who were available in the state of Vermont who were by statute recognized as competent to do these evaluations. Um, Vermont was one of only two states in the nation that didn't allow um, or recognize by statute uh, doctoral level psychologists from performing uh, 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 forensic competency evaluations. The other was Rhode Island. And we had a shortage and a backlog. And I'm glad to hear that uh, apparently Department of Mental Health has more people who are available to um, do the evaluations and that the backlog has trimmed significantly from um, six months ago when we were having this discussion in the legislature. Um, there's a, there are a number of uh, questions and comments that uh, I heard during the um, prior 50 minutes or so of discussion that uh, I was hoping I could clarify. Um, one of the things that I did want to clarify is that competency is an issue also in juvenile cases, that is in juvenile court and, and hence the family court. Um, doctoral level psychologists have always been approved for use in competency evaluations in, in those cases, um, but it had been recognized in Vermont um, in uh, criminal cases. Um, what the defense, or defense counsel, because it's 
you know, we don't do, we do almost every case in criminal court, but not every case in, in criminal court, um, uses uh, forensic psychologists oftentimes to uh, attack the positions of um, the psychiatrists who come up with the, their evaluations if we don't feel that they are appropriate. Um, and it, that might arise out of, that probably arises out of the court ordered evaluation. Um, and the court has to make a determination based on what they hear in evidence of, of whether or not um, the person is competent or not. So there is, it's a full blown evidentiary hearing on whether somebody understands the proceedings that they're taking part of, whether they can adequately participate with their um, counsel in uh, defending themselves in these cases. Um, and, and as uh, uh, Karen Weber indicated, that can arise out of a bunch of different areas, whether it's a major mental illness, traumatic brain injury, developmental disability, or the like. Um, ultimately, the qualification to do competency evaluations, um, whether an individual is qualified to do that really rests with the court. But because there has been a presumption that psychiatrists um, are, are statutorily um, authorized to do it, um, where there is a, a, a balance to be made, oftentimes the psychiatrists would would get the nod um, one way or the other um, when the court is trying to make a decision. That would be, that whole situation is contrary to really what the, the nation does except for Rhode Island. Um, so we believe that for a bunch of different reasons that, and, and again, I, 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 I wouldn't have made the suggestion if I didn't think it was gonna be beneficial that doctor level um, psychologists um, appropriately should be used to um, deal with these cases. Now, the other, the other side of this is it's not just about the initial evaluation that perhaps the uh, um, Department of Mental Health uh, through the contractor um, is, uh, um, is doing regarding these evaluations, but it's the availability of individuals to all of the members of the criminal justice system, whether it's the prosecution or the defense, um, <laughs> test those evaluations. Um, it's not a monopoly that uh, um, Department of Mental Health has uh, on doing these evaluations, and they really don't have or shouldn't have a um, horse in the race of uh, um, whether somebody's competent or not, but it's the availability of of competent people to um, test the evidence that's out there, whether it, it comes from the Department of Mental Health or anywhere else. Um, and so the more people we have available to do it um, and competent people, and I suggest that doctoral level psychologists is one of the areas uh, that are, is probably, you know, that's where I would like to see it go. I, I don't, there are some states that allow, um, you know, master's level clinicians and, and other types of licensure to do these evaluations. And I don't suggest that we go there. I, I think a doctoral level um, of uh, evaluator, psychologist, uh, um, clinical psychologist or PhD level psychologist is, uh, is probably that, that's about as hard as uh, far in the, um, kind of the credentials as I would want to go. I wouldn't want to go any lower than that. Uh, that that's going to be helpful ultimately. It is way too soon right now to make any evaluation about whether or not this is um, assisting the system. Um, that's always one of the kind of the frustrating things is a lot gets passed, goes into effect on July 1st. And then on August 8th, we have a, uh, a hearing to, to see how it's going and basically um, nobody's had a chance to take a breath as to what uh, um, what this is all going to mean and, and be implemented. So uh, as far as we're concerned, we, we've been supportive of it and uh, we're interested to see how it pans out. We've actually been using 
as I said, doctoral level psychologists um, to testify <laughs> of the psychiatrist um, for decades. Um, you used the term test the competence of the psychiatrist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that went up. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, it's interesting because they, psychiatrists and psychologists do very different things when they um, evaluate a, uh, an individual's um, competence to stand trial. Um, psychologists are trained in administration of a number of different uh, um, instruments that have been uh, tests and the like that have been um, validated. Uh, that's part of what they do. The uh, psychiatrists don't administer those tests. They have sort of clinical evaluations and talk to the people about the legal elements that are part of it. So oftentimes when you are, if you're a defense counsel or if you are a prosecutor and you didn't like the result of the mental health, uh, um, independent mental health evaluation, you'll hire a PhD or doctoral level psychologist to pick apart the clinical evaluation of whatever happened with the Department of Mental Health. Um, and the um, doctor level psychologists are um, very effective at doing that because they have more um, tools at their disposal to make that determination. Um, that's kind of in the weeds for, for you folks as legislators, but um, that, that's the facts as, as the, how these cases, per, um, when they're contested, how they proceed. Um, I don't know how, uh, I, I did receive the uh, um, department's proposed memo on scheduling and the like uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, I will be interested to see how that works out. Well, it's a, I hope there's some <laughs> respond to this, but what I'm what I'm hearing is that there might be a different reason to allow psychologists to to engage in these in these competency exams besides the backlog that they might actually be more qualified in certain instances to do the evaluation and I would rather have that conversation than one about scheduling if that makes sense and so I guess my question in that is. Uh, if, if the Defender General's office has availed themselves of, of a clinical psychologist now that it's allowed in this pre-sunset period because it was the better evaluator versus like, do you see a case coming up where you'd rather have a clinical psychologist and you feel like that would be a better decision, not like whoever's available first kind of thing? We, we've actually been doing that for decades. Well, you said for decades, but how, but you've been doing it as an understudy to the person who has to write off on the evaluation. Is that right? Not how really have you been study. We have done it as part of um, litigation to attack the, um, the opinion of the psychiatrist um, who uh, did an evaluation that we don't feel is appropriate. So this goes back to my like original question for Ben, which is the importance of who gets to do this. So you're saying that right now in Vermont, a psychiatrist is the only one though that can go into court with that initial determination of competency, but you can, you can attack their report with a clinical psychologist. Yes, the, the only thing right now that is the independent evaluation um, that is ordered by the court through the Department of Mental Health prior to the passage of the legislation that you just passed was a psychiatrist. Uh, <laughs> passage of the legislation, um, qualified uh, doctoral level psychologists, and they may be clinical psychologists, they may be um, PhD level psychologists, um, there's, you know, there's the PSYDs, there's the PhD level psychologists, both of them um, uh, would be qualified to um, do these evaluations in the first instance and would, and what we are hoping is to attract more of those people 
um, to the state because we've had a turnover and a, a large number of retirements in this uh, community um, over the last couple of years. I don't know. I think I'm more confused about the problem we're trying to solve, but. The problem we're trying to solve. Yeah. Is, was the backlog, mm -hmm. but also whether or not because of the backlog, which may or may not no longer exist, uh, would it be who should be doing these evaluations? Mm -hmm. And so we put a sunset on them. On the uh, psychologist to get this information and take testimony. Well, it's the backlog, to be clear, I think the backlog still exists. It's yeah. just not as enormous as it was a year ago or six months ago. Um, uh, and it's really. Uh, there were about 80 of them backlogged up, and people were. 80 instead of 160. Right. And people were spending time in jail because they had to wait for the competency evaluation. But the, okay, but the only person who can do the initial competency evaluation has to be through DMH. It's court order. Yes. So it's court order. It has to be court order. It has to be court order. Yeah. To be court order. So okay, so that's what that's why if DMH is saying we're neutral, but we're still only using. No, they said they were neutral to the psychiatric social worker and others. Right. Oh, so they're not that, neutral. I to, think they were in favor. We can check with Karen, but I thought her testimony was in the letter indicates they're in favor of the psychologist. Oh, I thought she came on and said they're neutral about us. Well, the question is, do we expand? I read the letter as being in favor of the current statute and lifting the sunset, if I could put that. Please come back on. Yeah. So they're, they're here. Yeah, the treat the depart departments, DMH and Dale, do not have a position as to whether to expand evaluators beyond forensically trained psychiatrists and psychologists pursuant to the yeah. yes. Yes. So they're so beyond what's well, now allowed. Karen, what, yes. what yes. But let Karen speak so to that. double negative. Are you to read your letter? <laughs> <laughs> That, that was basically what I was was going to say. Um, you know, we don't really, I think um, Matt said it really well, we don't have a dog in the fight, right? Like it doesn't, we, our job, right, is we get an event, we get by statute, we have been told that this is what we need to do. We hire evaluators, we do the competency evals. We do not have, you know, our role is to assure that people who need mental health treatment get it. As to whether or not someone's found competent and who's appropriate to find them competent, you know, we really feel like we're a neutral in this, and so we're not taking a position on it. Let's go back. Is that clear? Well, it is, except what I think I heard was that you're still almost exclusively using psychiatrists. So do you feel like there's situations where a psychologist would be a, a better person to evaluate competency that they're not getting a psychologist, they're getting a psychiatrist? <clears throat> We, and when, in cases of intellectual disabilities, we do use the positives. Okay, but you weren't before this law? No, we were, yep, no, that it was allowed. I think what changed now is that psychologists can also do people who have primary mental illness. Um, we are continuing to use psychiatrists for that, um, but we use psychologists when intellectual disabilities are, um, when are, aren't indicated. Okay. So it can seem like it's going to be a major change. <laughs> Matt, you still have any comments? Um, I, I'm sorry, Senators. Say that again. Any further comments for you from you on this issue? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I was around obviously for pretty much every part of this, and and I know that there are obviously members of this committee that weren't part of that testimony and. Um, you know, the horse was beat pretty dead about the, this, this issue of uh, uh, the doctoral level psychologist. I didn't think that there was any real, I didn't think there was any opposition and I didn't hear even opposition. From, I didn't hear opposition from the psychiatrists who testified um, or anybody else. The, the question, as I understand it, is whether it should be expanded to people beyond doctoral level psychologists 
Um, and I would not be in favor of that, but I, I would be perfectly fine. Play out. And again, we've had a month so far. So it's a little early to make any evaluation. Um, the only thing I, I'd also want to comment on, I had on my list here, uh, but, but I do know that our what psychiatrists um, in the in the past, um, you know, who who finds it, who finds everybody competent, who doesn't find everybody competent, um, who didn't break it down on a um, great ethnic uh, background. This question was brought up earlier, but we definitely know who the ones who are more likely just as a matter of statistics to find somebody competent versus not. So it's, it's like you could be judge shopping. Yeah, except for we don't assign any of them, so. Um, and it's called psychiatry shopping. Signed out of the Department of Mental Health and, uh, and, and uh, um, the name comes up and we say, oh, that one is very, very likely to find this person competent. Um, you know, then we have to be more, uh, we have to take a look at that closely and, and see what we're going to do with it. Do you use, do you use Vermont or out of state psychologists when you're? Um, we have used both depending upon uh, the appropriateness in any given case. Um, I, there's, there's, there are people we bring up from Harvard, uh, McLean Medical, um, who are, you know, one of the guys who <laughs> behavioral pharmacologist, and he's actually a PhD level psychologist who talks about drug interactions and how they work with mental illness. And, and um, that's somebody who's not, he's not a Vermont guy, but he's, you know, one of the world leaders in the, in that area. We bring him up there. There are people from around who, uh, they're not just, not just from Vermont, um, but the statutory presumption of psychiatrist is something that uh, um, really was only part of Vermont and Rhode Island law. And I, we thought it beneficial that it, if we could get in line with the rest of the country. Other? I have one more. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I've had too much caffeine. Um, <laughs> um, so Representative Emmons helped me understand that the second part of the question is whether others would be right. included. And so I guess my question for our Defender General's office is, do you see, I mean, the only reason I could think of including others is because there's not a lot of diversity in terms of who ha is a doctor, a level psychologist or psychiatrist. We struggle with that a lot in the mental health field writ large for people of color. Um, you know, I can probably think of other discrepancies too, but it's a huge discrepancy among someone you might find that's a black mental health professional or otherwise. So I just wonder in your perspective, if you think there are cases where you would want expertise from somebody um, who has a perspective that might close disparities beyond people who are licensed uh, doctoral level psychologists or psychiatrists. I haven't thought about that, to be honest. Uh, um, you know, I would hope somebody who's a doctoral level uh, um, psychologist or psychiatrist would uh, um, have training to recognize those issues. Um, I don't know that if you got a, had a master's level person in color looking at uh, the issues that you would be any better or worse off. I, I, I don't know the answer, honestly. I haven't, haven't thought about it that in that, in that term. Well, maybe let's not think out loud about it, but if you could come back with an answer, any empirical studies, or we could ask the medical community, you know, that, that to me is the, is the question I want to answer for that second part is, or is there a gap? Because it's very hard to make it to your doctoral level of psychology or psychiatry if you come from a marginalized background. 
I think one of the questions to ask is really maybe a little bit of flipping that. So is, um, is there sufficient diversity within our doctoral level psychologists and psychiatrists to, to um, account for um, providing adequate um, representation for these evaluations for yeah. people of color? Yeah. I would like to know that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Absolutely. We don't, I don't, I mean, right, 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 right. Yeah, no, that's just what Matt, the question. Matt, do you want to comment? <laughs> it's probably a better question for the, for the doctors, to be honest. I agree. Um, final question for me would be, is there geographic disparities in terms of, or is it just individual psychologists or psychiatrists who find competency or not? Yeah, you know, with with uh, mental health now using the uh, um, you know the video video evaluations over computers, um, the the that issue is is less of an issue. The issue that arises more is the availability of and and how people are kind of respond to the video as opposed to in person. Um, but it's I don't think it's. Uh, um, I don't think it's as geographic um, as it as it used to be. I think it is more um, facility with technology and just comfort level with using that. Uh, many of our clients, and this is going to be this is what I foresee, by the way, with the proposal that the Department of Mental Health has with these the um, Many of our clients are um, transient. Um, some are homeless. Um, they don't stay the same place over and over. They are either they do or they don't have some level of mental illness. They aren't always they aren't particularly reliable when it comes to their scheduling, um, and uh, um, or their ability to read. Um, I think that uh, I guess if everything was a perfect world, the department's memo with these forty-eight hour deadlines and the like are. Um, you know, that would be wonderful if that would work. Um, I just don't think that's the way our clients work. And so um, we're either gonna have a lot of arrest warrants or we're gonna have, uh, you know, there's gonna be some level of disruption with the clientele that we deal with anyway, that are, you know, qualified to have uh, competency evaluations um, and, uh, and, and getting them scheduled. And that's, Part of the world we live in, I think. So uh, while I, um, I guess we would aspire to be able to uh, work with the Department of Mental Health, I don't have great hopes that our clientele are going to be amenable to that. But we'll see. Because I got it yesterday afternoon. So we'll see what happens. We'll be back to this and I'll put your video later. <laughs> Um, Can I just ask another you? question for Matt Valerio? Oh, no, it's actually for Karen. Can I ask her question? Another question for Karen, if you're available. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I'm just uh, curious if there's any background questions or information that's gathered from the, um, the person to be evaluated uh, in order for the department to understand whether or not you need to seek an evaluator that has some uh, potentially, you know, specialized um, skill or background um, that would be relevant to assess. So whether it's a person of color or an LGBTQIA person or a, uh, like you were talking about, a person with a disability, it is. Um, it seems as though. Um, that was considered for people with um, developmental or intellectual disabilities or brain injury. I'm just wondering if other um, characteristics are taken into consideration when assigning or requesting an evaluator. Um, no, so all we get, right, again, we're not a party. We're not at these hearings. Um, all we get is a referral from the court, which generally includes the charging documents and an affidavit that talks about what the crime is. Um, 
we may know the person, um, which is may, why we may know a psychologist is indicated or it may indicate they can ask for a psychologist, they can <laughs> indicate there's an intellectual disability. Um, again, I think the thing to remember too is, you know, I haven't, this is a competency is a legal question, right? It's do you know how to talk to your attorney? Do you, you know, I, I don't know how much um, they're not super in-depth evaluations, right? It's not like we're doing a mental health assessment where we're really trying to think about what programming does the person need. It's it's very different. It's can they, are they confident to engage with their attorneys? So we don't have a lot of background information. We, again, we're not even in court when these are done. We just get, the <clears throat> emails us, we take it, we, um, and we just assign it. We don't pick, we don't, we don't tell people we're not picking certain psychiatrists based on who we think, right? We just, we send it out and whoever can take it, takes it. The only difference is that if there's an intellectual disability, we assign it to a psychologist, but otherwise whoever gets it, gets it. I will just quickly respond. I know that there are times when we do hear from um, mainly the defense bar that they have a concern with a, an evaluator. If we do get that, we we have our own medical director read the evaluation to see if she has any concerns. And then we also, Novatel has a head psychiatrist who oversees. Um, and so we do, if someone raises a concern with us, we do make sure to go back and, and make sure we feel comfortable with the evaluation, but we don't, we don't assign a special psychiatrist for certain people. So, so I, I'm presuming you, um, have interpreters available for people with different languages? We do, yep. Okay, thanks. A question, from Representative. I couldn't pronounce it. Okay. Um, someone earlier mentioned Inovatel. Karen, I think it might have been you. I'm curious if DMH is using. Um, in Novatel clinicians for evaluations remotely via telehealth? And if you are, um, are you using in Novatel scheduling services too to schedule those? Uh, no, we schedule them. Have you considered using in Novatel scheduling? Because I know they offer that. I'm just curious whether that might help with addressing some of the backlog. Um, we haven't. I... Uh, we have we have not. I don't know the logistics of that. Again, it's I think the most of the delay is just trying to make sure that we're working with the defense council to find a date. Um, but could we could we do that in the future? I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Tim Waters Dumont, the representative of the state's attorneys. Hello, Mr. Chair, and I, I think I'll be pretty brief because you've already had uh, the experts going in front of me. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're we're very hopeful that many of the changes that S ninety one put into um, place will will eventually um, bear some results um, for all the different parties. And and you know, in the question about no victim notification, as long as it's allowed by law, our victim advocates. Um, inform victims as to every step of the of the process um, when there's a criminal justice involved um, individual. Um, and, you know, we do think the S91 will um, be helpful in the competency evaluations going forward. We are we were supportive of the bill as it passed. Um, and we uh, agree with the Defender General's perspective that it's important to have as many qualified evaluators as possible for the state to um, uh, make sure that individuals are being evaluated as soon and as close in time to potential court hearings as possible. Um, that said, if there's going to be um, an extension of the sunset as to doctoral level psychologists or an expansion that this group considers, um, I had sent along a mostly technical recommendation to attorney Novogrowski that you then also amend um, 13 VSA 4816E, which is the presumptive allowance of relevant portions of what was previously just psychiatrist reports to include whatever the list may be. So if it's doctoral level psychologist, which it is now, um, or other individuals who are professionals uh, in this area that 
46, sorry, sorry, 4816E in Title 13 is amended to reflect whatever the list is. Um, and next session, we would we would recommend that 38, uh, 13 VSA 4816E include doctoral level psychiatrists if the sunset will be extended. And I, I've, I've sent that along um, to um, uh, Ben, so he has it uh, as well. But really, that's the extent of our comments. We're meeting every couple of weeks with DMH and, and, and Dale. Um, to make sure that if we can be helpful on anything, we, we we will be, and we're certainly interested in seeing if there's any progress that can be made in competency restoration going forward. Do the state's attorneys have any recommendation regarding those other than doctoral level psychologists? Uh, we leave that in your learned hands, Mr. Chair. <laughs> That's what we need to weigh in on. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, any questions? No. Hey, that, that was brief, Tim, and thank you very much. Thank you all. Good to see you. Forward to seeing you coming south one of these days. <laughs> I look forward to that as well. The, the blue Ben, uh, I understand the menu hasn't changed, so I know exactly what to order. It hasn't changed in years. <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, it has, but it's still the same old blue Ben with a new owner. They're doing a great job. Um, our next witness is the Honorable Judge Domey. Good afternoon. Are you open today? We are. We're in a different location, but we are certainly open for business today. It's good to be here. Tom Zoni usually has a judge. sign behind him saying "open." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I I too think I can be brief. We the judiciary supported the expansion to include the doctoral level psychologists for the evaluations, and I think what I've heard during the discussion this okay. afternoon ties into the idea that, well, perhaps people started to look at this because of the backlog and because of the delays. But the question really becomes, even if you took that out, is it the right direction to go in? And if you look at 40, the other jurisdictions, they go there. Uh, I believe for, uh, 48 of the other states were already there. Uh, and they found that having uh, a broader pool than just psychiatrists enabled the effective administration of justice. And from contacts with my colleagues across the country, when I've asked about the timelines, I am sorry to report that the timelines between getting reports in Vermont and getting reports in other jurisdictions don't match. We take a lot longer when we had the backlogs. And even in the normal course, I suggest, uh, we took longer to get our reports and evaluations. I believe, for instance, New Hampshire requires that if someone's incarcerated, the report has to be submitted within 45 days. If they're not, it's within 90 days. There are jurisdictions that have actual, uh, much tighter requirements than that. And by expanding the pool of qualified individuals, you're adding a diversity to the evaluators that doesn't exist with just uh, one uh, discipline of psychiatrists. And you're affording the opportunity to have uh, more uh, reports done by more people, thereby shortening the time frame so we can get the cases into court sooner. And, and that loses part of the issue that we heard about from Mr. Valerio also, and that is you lose touch with people when they have extended periods of time. We saw that during the pandemic. Okay. So the more we can do to shorten those time frames, I suggest that it will also mitigate the potential of defendants losing touch with their attorneys, perhaps. And it should help all of us move forward in the criminal justice system, not just, again, to address a backlog, but to keep the system moving uh, with case flow as efficiently and ex expeditiously as we can. And I, as far as lowering, I won't say lowering, as far as expanding who can uh, do the evaluations, I was just looking at a, a document put out by the National Center of State Courts from a number of years ago, and they mentioned that there are some that allow master level with licensure, mental health professionals with forensic training. I'm not prepared to weigh in on whether the uh, Vermont system should go any further than where it has right now, uh, and, but we do support the idea of the doctoral level psychologists continuing not just during this period, period. but after the sunset. Questions, the judge. 
Judge, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. I, I, have a nice day. Take care. Uh, so, Judge, Judge Zoni, I do have a, a question that I'm going to follow up on Senator Ron Hinsdale's question. And the question uh, is any data that you keep, is there any data that you are, or perhaps it's the Department of Mental Health, keep uh, with regard to who is declared competent versus incompetent based on gender or gender identity, uh, race, ethnicity. Is that, is that um, pertinent data that you uh, have? And do you see that as uh, an issue in the process of competency determinations? We do not keep that data. And it would be difficult to assess whether it's, if, if you will, an issue in the process right now, because I don't have the data to compare it to and to understand yeah. and see how things came out. But we do not keep that type of data. I would note that the judiciary does have a commission on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Justice Cohen is working on a committee that is dealing with data. Uh, I submitted a report last year to the legislature regarding certain types of uh, identifying and demographic data. Uh, relative to civil cases. And I know that the DEI Commission is looking into different areas for data. So I will mention this uh, inquiry to Justice Cohen and see if it's something that they are looking at. Thank you very much. That would be very helpful. Great. Thank you all so much. Appreciate Thank it. you. I'm wondering. Um, um, I'm wondering who you would like to hear from besides someone from the American Psychological. I think it's the Vermont chapter. Of Vermont American chapter, American Psychological Association. Association. I believe that would be appropriate. And the Vermont Medical, Medical Society, Society would probably have psychiatrists. The, the the testimony that we heard from the psychiatrist psychiatrist affiliated with the Howard Center would be useful, okay. and 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 perhaps um, to have a a a doctoral level psychologist who's currently involved. Yeah. With what you. about the other groups that were mentioned in the legislation? So and then beyond that. Um, I think OPR might be helpful in identifying master's level uh, nurses. Who else was in? Like you have to ask for NAS. Nurse practitioners. Nurse practitioners. So I didn't have my glasses. Yeah. I didn't bring my glasses. You didn't bring your glasses. No. Thank you. No. Mental health providers, psychiatric and nurse practitioners. Maybe a local or other mental, mental, maybe, yeah. maybe hearing from a local mental health center. Yeah. You said the Howard Center. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so uh, when we were taking up S91, I was contacted by a doctoral level uh, licensed psychologist uh, uh, who I think we should probably reach out to as well. Uh, he, uh, he could serve that role. He, he is familiar with the, these issues. Uh, his name, I don't know, it's possible you've heard from him as well. Thomas Powell is his name. Yeah. yeah. Well, he used to work for the Department yes. of Corrections. Right. So I, know right. he is. I think he may have reached out, but you know, <clears throat> we can certainly, uh, Peggy can get in touch with him. Who else? Martin. I have a question because now I'm very confused. Um, but before I say that, before I ask the question, it, I, I do sometimes wonder if historically there's a little bit of bias toward or against psychologists and psychiatrists. I just, yes. it has come up in our health and welfare committee before, and it just, I just want to throw that out there. My question though now is it seems, or, or what question are we asking now? Well, the, the legislation requires us to consider whether or not to lift the sunset on the psychologist okay. and whether or not to add other professions okay. to the list. And that's where the other professions okay. come in. Now, whether we heard from actually Matt Valerio that he, that he thinks psychologists is enough. And we heard I think Tim agreed with him. Yeah. And I think Karen was neutral. And Judge Zone, I don't remember what he 
I don't think. Okay. Took my position. I think he should lift this. The sunset has not been lifted yet. Next no, that would need to be in legislation next year. The sunset's July of 24. July of 20, uh, June 30th, 24. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So we can lift it, or you can extend it for another year, <laughs> or, or or do away with do it. Do away with and it. Be like the other 48 states. Then the next question is, do you then expand the evaluation to these other entities? Then one thing that was it was it um, Tim mentioned or was it Matt? Someone mentioned about the time frame that yeah. some states have. Right. I think time frame Judge Zone did, and I think that's right. probably something to consider mm -hmm. as we consider recommendations because I people. The testimony we heard nowhere probably in judiciary was that those waiting competency evaluations were in jail longer on detention than any other group other than those with charges that like murder that would take you know a long time to resolve. Are any folks who are uh, required to go through the evaluation. Are any of them held at the state hospital? Or are they all held in DOC? I don't know. Can anybody answer that that's still on? Is that Karen? I can. Um, so it depends. Um, you can be ordered to have an inpatient <clears throat> evaluation or an outpatient evaluation. Um, if you're ordered to have an inpatient evaluation, uh, we have a psychiatrist that then assesses the person to determine whether or not they meet hospital level of care. If they do meet hospital level of care, um, then they would um, go to an inpatient unit, wouldn't necessarily be BPCH, could be any hospital. Um, if they uh, do not qualify for an inpatient, but instead get an outpatient evaluation, they could be in DOC or just in the community. So Karen, would, I know we're talking about a future possible forensic unit. Would any of these folks who are waiting for a competency evaluation or have been deemed incompetent to be housed at the forensic unit? Uh, so the way the legislation was written at the end of last year, um, it would um, be only for people that have been found incompetent or insane. So it wouldn't be um, before that determination was made and then it would be only for people that were incompetent or insane. Does that make sense? It does. So right now, if someone has been deemed to be incompetent, stand trial. Are they housed at the state hospital or at DOC in a correctional facility? Um, so again, it depends on their clinical needs. Um, if they're incompetent, they wouldn't remain in corrections. Um, the, the reason we propose the forensic facility, right, is because there's a gap between the folks that need hospital level of care and those that do not, but still remain in need of intensive services in a secure setting. Um, so right now they could wait in a hospital. Again, doesn't need to be VPCH, could be any hospital throughout our system. If they need that level of treatment, right? It depends on their clinical need, not whether or not they're incompetent. Um, or they could be in the community or in some sort of residential setting. If they are on an Act 248 order, then Dale provides services to them. So there is an uh, S89, I forget the act number, working group right now uh, looking at the gap issue. So there's another working group looking at who would go into a forensic unit. Wasn't that in 91 or was it in 89? It's in, yeah, that, that I'm on 89. that one. I can, what's the act number? Act number. Eight, yeah, it's 27. Thank you. Jesus. Yeah, I keep confusing I 89 and 27. I thought it was a root number to come up here. <laughs> so you want a world Now you want an 89 huh? <laughs> But at, at any rate, sort of. but that's, that issue is whether or not developmental disabled. Right. 
would be. That's a Dale. Right. That was, Dale issue. That was you. I'm that staying silent. silent. I'm staying <laughs> silent. That was you. We have three of us. I want to make sure the court services are available <clears throat> appropriately, or if they, there's a number of questions that are being asked over the hands. And Stuart Shore is the expert in that area, but I think that's yeah, not part of what still, we're doing. No, we're, we're not. We're justice not Oversight's not taking that. We're not we have a special that. committee for that. Mm -hmm. um, you were on that one yeah. too. We're going to go crazy. I wrote down a meeting for when for a when the second meeting. I wrote it down for Wednesday, and I was online and all set to go on, and they wouldn't let me join the team because <laughs> I was the wrong day. I no one's it wrong day. Two days. <laughs> it's easy to do. Oh, I know. Yeah, um, we don't have meetings scheduled. I think we have an idea of an agenda for the next meeting, but we also have other issues we have to take on. Um, but we don't have a meeting scheduled yet for September, October, November, December. So Peggy will do a doodle poll to everybody. Um, and then for our guests, um, we can send you the doodle poll, that would be helpful. But I think we'll at least do one more meeting on the on this question. Although it was, I found it pretty helpful today what the practitioners had to say. Definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you do the thing for what was it? The letter. Yes. And then we have the letter. Uh, I get credit. It's sent to to the committee. Why don't you send it to the committee? Can we act on that today? Well, it'd be helpful if we could talk about it briefly. You want me to share it on the screen? Yeah, why don't you share it on the screen? That's a heck of a lot easier. Yeah. Let's try it more. Oh, is this the letter of recommendation? Yeah, for the public immediate situation. So the question that some of my committee members had was whether or not they should be voting on this letter of recommendation since their, the health care and human services participation and health and uh, health care and human services, both House and Senate, was specific to Act 28 yeah, competency. Yes, so we right. would not vote on this letter. Okay. That's okay. Mr. Pye. <laughs> Nothing again, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. You can deal with it come January. <laughs> Got a heads up. A little bit more. I went that better than I could have read that. Oh, yeah. That's what he gets paid the big bucks for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's what is it? Okay. <clears throat> I'll move that we approve and send Senator Um, we saw we call it programs in the second line. We call it program in the first paragraph. So if we could just be consistent, I think it that second, it's the fourth line in the first paragraph, yeah. the first word, I think it should be programs in, mm -hmm. and then it says programs in the second. So I like the plural personally. So I'm just wondering. Should we takes a journalist? Should, should we, um, in that second paragraph, ask them to 
uh, I mean, we heard from these two areas. Uh, we don't know what the status is in the right. other areas. Should yep. we be asking them to look at the that's status? In the, that's in the last sentence, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, across the state. I missed that. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'll second that motion if nobody else. Second it is Mark. Would you make them up? Yes, yeah. I move the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Much unanimous. That was quick. Are we going to get a copy of that letter? It's yeah, I'll, uh, I can mail it out and then it'll, right now I have it by <laughs> regular mail and email to the commissioner. That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds good. Is there anything else? We'll do the doodle poll and Peggy, if you're still with us, if you send the doodle poll oh. to all members, including those health and welfare and human services members. Thank you for including us. Pardon? Thank you for including us. By statute. Oh, by st oh, it wasn't just a nice gesture. <laughs> 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 the house came up with. Sure, fixed no, no, it. Came up. Oh, you did it. So if they're required, they should be put in for per diem. Yes. Jenny? Huh? You should put in for per diem. Yes. You should put in for per diem. In expense. Well, I think How's that? he does that. <laughs> Yeah, 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 but it's on our way. Would you rather have? But thank you for reminding me. We got an email saying they put it for us, but I'm not sure. And I hope there's no one getting it. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all.